during the pandemic. So we have about 280 people who are participating today virtually, and there are like 50 of us who are here in the hall. So we decided before the pandemic that we wanted to take Ed Day on the road to give people the opportunity to hear from people who have connections both with the seminary and with SVS Press. So we chose Cleveland and then the pandemic hit. And so as we know with all things, we had to put it on ice. So it's good that we're here. And there are a few things I wanna say in way of introduction. I'll be working my way through several things here today. Ed Day was traditionally a fundraiser for the seminary, although it was really an education day. And so today is a fundraiser, but it's an education day. And we, talk, we pick, talked it over and we decided it was going to be terrific to really focus on certain things that you see from the, uh, the, the topics that are addressed here, that indeed the harvest is turning white. And the whole question of orthodox outreach, missiology, missions, evangelization, basic church growth, these are things that we're becoming more and more sensitive to and aware of, particularly post this time of a pandemic because the pandemic has gotten our attention in a way that really we didn't have that kind of focus before our lives were altered so quickly and so dramatically by this pandemic. So that's where the focus is today. So a few other things. The SVS press table is open for business and we're having a sale in Cleveland. So it's 25% off. Today is also, as I said, a fundraiser and there are a lot of giving initiatives. So you're gonna see certain things from me today, just like you were watching PBS during one of their fundraisers. So if you're a hundred dollar donor, you're gonna get an SVS press tumbler, okay? They will keep your drink cold or hot for 24 hours, guaranteed. I've tested it myself. $250 gets you a copy of the Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church by our distinguished keynote um, speaker today, Professor Bradley Nassif. We plan to have the books here today, but like with many things, there is a national paper shortage. And so our printers have got several of our SVS press books on hold because they can't find the paper to print. Okay, I've said enough about the shortages, okay? You get the picture but we have a deal. So $250, you'll get a signed copy of the Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church. As soon as it's here, we have pre-orders today as well. Right, Sarah? Okay, Sarah, hold your hand up. Okay, she's the SVS Press um, everything, okay? It has to do with SVS Press, we point to Sarah and she gets the job done. $500, you get uh, one Orthodox Profile Series set. That's a series that I actually edit for the press. It's growing considerably. And the Profile Series is one that focuses on relatively contemporary people who've had a lasting impact, particularly on the growth of the Orthodox Church or the rebirth of the Orthodox Church where we've been diminished. Um, and, you know, for another couple of bucks, I'll sign any of those books that have my name in them, okay? So a thousand dollar donation, you'll get volume one and volume two of A Voice for Our Time by Proto-Presbyter Alexander Schmemann. You know, it's been interesting for me because I like to tell people that I didn't have Father Schmemann as a professor, but he's definitely a teacher of mine, someone who's had a particularly strong impact on how I think, how I understand my faith. And it's been terrific in recent years that we've been able to digitize tapes, cassette tapes of Father Schmemann's lectures. They're available to you for free uh, on our website. But to actually get used to hearing his voice is a remarkable thing. And so many people who knew him personally have said to me, thank God you've done that because we hear him again. Well, I will guarantee you when you start reading volume one and the soon to be available volume two, of our English translations of Father Alexander Schmemann's broadcast into the former Soviet Union under Radio Free uh, Europe, Radio Liberty, you'll hear his voice. And he is as contemporary today as he was when he was speaking then. It's a remarkable thing. 
So those things are available to you and you'll be hearing me talk about that, you know, throughout the day. If you want to go, uh, for those of you who are online, you can go to, to www.spots.edu give for your donation today. Uh, and for those of you in the room, you can fill out the little yellow donation cards. You can call the seminary uh, and simply use the enclosed envelope, which is found in the annual reports, which are at your table. The annual report reflects, again, how St. Vladimir's is really at the forefront of Orthodox theological education. And I'd particularly call your attention to the relatively new faculty, faculty that have been added over the last two or three years. It's quite amazing. So it's good to be back personally for me in Cleveland, back in this parish. And I wanna introduce Father Grama, who is the Dean of this beautiful cathedral as the host priest for our event today, who has a few words to say to us. Father Grama. Thank you, Father President. Good morning. Good morning. My words are not from the wisdom, they are from the heart. I just want to extend our welcome as hosts of this uh, blessed cultural uh, theological event. I hope it will be also a time of fellowship and uh, uh, applied uh, faith. Uh, here at St. Mary, some of you are familiar with our parish. We are uh, certainly the oldest Romanian Orthodox parish in the United States. And so we, we really endear this title because, and others envy us for this, uh, because we have uh, a lot uh, to tell, a lot of great stories to tell. Uh, as you see, even uh, in this hall, uh, there, are, uh, there is a frieze or a bas relief representing the entire history of Romania from the pre-Roman times, starting right there on my right, coming to the 16th century, and continuing on the left side all the way to 1940. This frieze was brought uh, to the World's Fair in New York in 1939. It was uh, paid for by the Royal Foundations of Romania. And due to the war, they were unable to take it back. So they donated it to, to St. Mary's Parish. So this is a story which is continuously being told and it represents a, a window uh, to, uh, to the history of Romania. And uh, it's uh, certainly a gift to the American people through us. Uh, in practical terms, uh, if you need the restrooms, they are on, in the lobby on my left. And uh, today, I hope uh, there will be a, a time of growth for all of you, of learning, and the time of generosity. We have to bear fruits in the Lord, and sometimes they have to be materialized, because otherwise, otherwise our faith becomes just a philosophy, and you know it is not that. Our faith is the way, the way of life taught by Christ and the Holy Apostles. Today, once again, welcome. Our ladies are cooking in the kitchen for you. I hope you will stay for lunch and you will enjoy. If you have any need, see me. God bless you. Thank you, Parente. We're almost there for the first presentation, but I have a few more uh, commercial remarks to make. If you have questions during the day that you would like to ask us to, to cover during the question and answer session, please write them down on the index cards, which can be found in the middle of your tables. Uh, and for those of you online, you can submit them through chat and we'll be working our way through that during the Q&A period. Uh, the new book, the Nasif book is available on ebook on Kindle for those of you that really just can't wait. I could see some of your faces when I said there's a delay. So for those of you that are having anxiety attacks because it's not in your hand today, you can find it on Kindle. I also want to thank our sponsors for the event today. Uh, we already have uh, $10,000 in hand uh, for people uh, who said, let's get this thing rolling. They stepped up for us. And I particularly want to thank the hosting parishes, St. Luke the Evangelist, Antiochian Orthodox Church in Bainbridge Township, uh, St. Innocent uh, Orthodox Church, the OCA Parish in Olmsted Township, our host parish here, St. Mary uh, Cathedral, 
and our event sponsors, um, the Greek Orthodox Ladies Philoptical Society of Saints Constantine and Helen, Greek Orthodox Cathedral, Holy Trinity Orthodox Church in Parma. A close friend, someone who's been a long-standing supporter of the seminary. We worked together shoulder to shoulder when he served as executive chair of our board of trustees. And he has uh, continued to sort of be a right hand when I need it. Always available to me and always appreciated. Alex Machaski, uh, whom almost everybody in Cleveland knows without any introduction, uh, has been a big sponsor today. And one of our current trustees, it's her first outing after a little, little medical history here about Judge Catherine Fuller. So Alex and Judge Catherine, if you'd stand so we could acknowledge your service to the seminary over the years. And also the Herzak family with Insurance Systems Group, the Insurance Systems, again, were very generous supporters of the day. All much, much, much appreciated. Our first speaker today, again, is an old friend. Uh, one could say in certain senses, we have almost family connections. The very Reverend Dr. Eric Tossi is an assistant professor of pastoral theology at St. Vladimir's Seminary. He's chairman of the Commission on Mission and Evangelism for the Diocese of New York and New Jersey in the OCA. He's the rector of St. Gregory the Theologian Church in Wappingers Falls, New York. Father Eric possesses a wealth of diverse experiences and knowledge as a priest and educator. In addition to his current ministries, he was secretary of the OCA, longtime chairman of the OCA's Department of Evangelization, a mission priest in Billings, Montana, a parish priest in Las Vegas, Nevada. Father Eric also served as a captain in the U.S. Army, and he's held many other positions in the business world. So it's my great pleasure to introduce my brother, Archpriest Eric Tossi. Well, that's very, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, yeah, so we're good. Okay. So I, I'm wonderful to be here. Wonderful to see some faces and people that I haven't seen in a while. I think when we get out and we go to the world, it's almost like you, you forget what people look like without their masks on. And then they take it down and you're like, oh, I know who you are. So it's wonderful to be here. And I'm, I'm thank you, Father Chad, for bringing me out to speak. We're kind of going in a reverse order in the sense that my talk is actually the result of the other two talks. And we thought it would be interesting if we gave you an example of what we teach at the seminary. Uh, I primarily teach right now the, the third year students on very practical aspects of mission uh, about pastoral theology. And so we thought it'd be good to hear a class about how we teach people to start catechism programs and how we receive people in the church. And so uh, I have everything on my computer, which messes everything up, but I have to use my slide. So you should usually there'd be, just imagine there's a big screen behind me and, and a big PowerPoint, and then you can just picture it in your mind. But I think they're going to make this available so you can see. So um, anyway, so that's what we're going to do is this is an example of some of the classes that we teach at St. Vladimir's to help priests before they get out into the field and do uh, the great work that they do. So I'm gonna to talk today a bit about the different levels of bringing people into the church, as well as the programs that we do in order to, to instruct them before they're received into the church. And it's a real way, and, and again, there's so many different ways and so many priests do so many wonderful things. This is a way to introduce you to the programs. And I wanna start with my first catechumen I ever had. So this was, I was a new priest. I graduated St. Vladimir's. I was assigned to a mission parish in Billings, Montana. You know, a good boy from Little Falls, New Jersey. They send me out to Billings, Montana. Makes sense, right? And uh, actually it was funny because one of my parishioners was my grammar school teacher from Little Falls, New Jersey, who ended up marrying someone and living in Montana. So you never know. Um, so anyway, so I had my first catechumen and I was super excited. This person had read his way into the faith. He had come to me with a really a wealth of knowledge of orthodoxy. And I was like, this is great. This is what's going to happen. And I worked the catechism class and we did all this stuff. And then I brought him into the church and I chrismated him. 
and I never saw him again. And it really shook me, really shook me. I, I was like, what am I doing here? You know, how am I approaching this? What, what's the whole point of it? And actually the whole trajectory of what I was doing as a priest changed with that event. It led me to eventually really starting an in-depth study of, of evangelism and mission and eventually getting my doctorate in that area. And it just, and, and, and starting the mission programs in the OCA and, and it really changed everything the way I thought. So I said, I don't want other priests to have that same experience. I want them to be able to go and at least have some knowledge of what they're doing, not just what we're doing, but how we're doing it. And so that's where this all sort of happened from that first catechumen. So you never know, those events can make a big change in your life. Um, recently, one of the things, and Father, I know Father Chad's going to talk more about this, many parishes in the church are experiencing a kind of revival during this COVID time. Uh, we have more catechumens coming in than we would have ever thought. And we've been thinking about this. Like, why is it? I mean, my, my church in, in Wappinger's Falls over the, I brought in 10 new families plus another dozen catechumens just in the space of one year. Like, where are they coming from? Why are they finding us? And I think this is an important sort of question we have to ask. And this is not just us. This is, I'm talking to clergy all over the place, and many of them are experiencing the same thing. And uh, it's, it's an amazing sort of way. A lot of it has to do because we, I, uh, we were just talking, Dr. Uh, Nassif and I, about I, I did 40 podcasts on what I call Orthodoxy 101. Basic stuff, each one, one hour. All these people were finding it. I guess you're sitting at home, you don't have much to do, you start looking and all of a sudden they come across it and that attracted them to the church. And so just simple little things like that opens a door for so many people to discover what we have. And the final point I will, I will make, and by the way, they're young people too. A lot of them are like in between the ages of like 20 and 35. So that's, which again, kind of destroys that myth that that's a lost generation. The other thing I would have to say, and this is a very important point that we have to make. What we do in the church has to match what they're reading in the books. Many people read themselves into the church now. When my father, I'm half Italian, half Russian, I'm an Italic, as we call it. And uh, <laughs> when my father became uh, Orthodox, he basically went to the priest and said, read this book next week, I make you Orthodox. And you know, that was it. Many, now we have such a wealth through St. Vlad's Press and other, that when people read this, they need to see what they see when they walk into the church and they will spot, especially this younger generation, they'll spot hypocrisy like that. And so what we need to do is make sure that what we are doing is orthodox because that's precisely what people are looking for. So there we go. That's my little introduction. So I wanna talk a bit about what is catechism. And catechism really is that instruction that we do to prepare people for either baptism and chrismation or chrismation, we prepare them for the reception of the church. There's a very old history of the very ancient history in the church on receiving people, some of it quite um, extensive. But I want to start with just reading the prayer that we do for catechumens when we, when we officially make them catechumens. I want you to listen to the words from the prayer. O Lord our God who dwells on high, and regards the humble of heart, who sent forth as the salvation of the race of men, thine only begotten Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Look down upon thy servants, the catechumens, who have bowed their head necks before thee. Make them worthy in two time of the laver of regeneration, the remission of sins, and the robe of incorruption, and unite them to thy holy Catholic and apostolic church, and number them with thy chosen flock. Now think about those words. What are we saying here? We are saying that we are asking God, first off, to come down and bless these people. But li listen very carefully. The laver of regeneration, the robe of incorruption, and the remission of sins. That's it in the heart of what we're doing. We're bringing people in to find new life. We're bringing people in 
to fulfill their life. We're not come bringing people in to destroy their souls or make them into little automatons or whatever it is. We're making them real humans. And so my brothers and sisters, as we draw people in, that's what we have to keep in mind. Come on, flip, there we go. So true catechism, if we're really serious about this. People are being joined to the fullness of the church. So whatever their past is, which you never say, oh, that was really bad. What you're doing is bringing them and saying, now you're fulfilling what you're really meant to be. You're drawing them into that fullness of the church. You are there as clergy and others, teachers, so they can receive, you can transmit, and they can receive the truth. Not my truth, not his truth, the truth, the truth of the church. Not in a triumphal way, by the way, but in a way that is that laver, that laver you know, has that wonderful idea of being soothing and, and, and balm. And this is very important. They are not fleeing from something. They are fleeing to something. Very often people, I don't know how many people here have, have taken the journey into the Orthodox Church and whatever the impetus that got, got you in that journey, you were not there to flee away from something, even though there may be issues. Because if you keep fleeing from something, you're never going to get anywhere. You're just going to flee to another place. But if you're fleeing to something, then you'll have a journey. And as I always remind the people when, I, when they are receiving the church, okay, you completed one journey. Now the real one begins. And it's going to take the rest of your life. So if you're fleeing to something, you're always fleeing to the church. And they need to accept the faith with humility. This is 2,000 years that has been handed down from generation to generation. The church forms us. We don't form the church. The church forms us. And so we accept that with humility and accept what it is. That doesn't mean you, you don't think about it and be critical about it, but you accept what's been given to you because that's the life-saving aspect of catechism. It gives you that ability to understand truth. And finally, and I cannot stress this enough, it should be filled with hope and joy and, and love and, and all the things that, you know, the Apostle Paul talks about what we're supposed to be as Christians. There's nothing sadder than seeing a catechumen who's a, just a glum person. This is joyful. This is great. This is wonderful. This is what we are as Christians. So let's make sure we have that in all that we do. But as I remind them, Matthew. 2315. Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites. I love that one. You know, it just kind of gets you all going. For you travel land and sea to make one proselyte. And when he is one, you make him twice a son of hell as yourselves. <laughs> right? Oh my gosh. Sometimes people go and they make these catechumens, they do all this work, and the person becomes the son of hell. <laughs> to the priest and to all the other people around them. So be careful. Be careful in what you do. So I want to talk about some groups of people that you have to be aware of that as you come. And we're going to talk about different groups. How long do I have? Half hour? Something like that? Yeah. He's giving me the sign. So yeah, I'm not going to be able to go through everything because you could tell I could talk on and on and on. But uh, there, there are different levels. So you have someone who's a guest, someone who first visits your parish. And that's very important how you receive them that first time in the church. And those amongst you who came into the church for the first time, it's overwhelming, isn't it? You got priests doing this and incense and he's throwing water at you. And there's all sorts of sensory overload. How we draw them into that first time is critical. And then from there, you go to someone who's an inquirer, who's just beginning to want to learn more about the church, came a few times, starting to get comfortable. How do we get them to start that journey into orthodoxy? And then we have that next step is when they become catechumens, when they're actually taking the instruction to be received in the church. And then we have that third part. And one of the most critical ones, the one that I missed in my first catechumen, 
was how do we receive them in church and integrate them into that community? That's the key. It's not so much as being received into the church, but being integrated into that community, because that's what we do as mission, right? As Orthodox, we create Eucharistic communities and people have a communion and a community together. And so how we do that is absolutely important. But you're going to have different groups that come in. And I have a couple of ones I want to give you examples of. There's the issue people. Who are the issue people? They're angry about something that's happening in the faith that they have had before. So they want to come into orthodoxy and they want to have that issue and they want to talk to the priest about it. And certainly you let them talk, you let them get it out of their system. The problem is that when you have someone who becomes, starts journeys, journey to orthodoxy over an issue, that eventually there's going to be another issue and another issue and another issue. And so you have to learn to, for them to put that aside and move on to the next step in their life. We have the culture seekers. They're the, they're the ones who, I read Dostoevsky, so now I'm going to really become a Russian. And they start dressing like a Russian and they start talking with a Russian accent and they grow a big beard. And the only reason they're attracted to the church is because of the culture, which I guess is okay. But that's not the purpose of the Orthodox Church. The purpose of the Orthodox Church is the fullness of the truth. So again, be cautious with them. We have the wanderers. Who are the wanderers? Well, let's see. I went to, for a while, I was, a, uh, I was an evangelical. And then I went over and became a Lutheran. And then I got tired with that. I became a Buddhist. And then I got tired with that. And then I became a Roman Catholic and I got tired with that. It's always usually the, the liturgical scale. They go, kind of go up the liturgical ladder until they find orthodoxy and then they can't go any farther. But just understand that sometimes their journey uh, can happen. I've had people who have literally been five different faiths before they finally settled on orthodoxy. And I always tell them, your journey's done. Okay, this is it. <laughs> so now you need to be really focused on what it is because you, everything you were looking for is found here. We have the apathetic. That'd be strange, right? Someone who's apathetic become orthodox. Well, you know, I met this Greek woman and she, I have to become orthodox in order to get married. So whatever, father, I couldn't care less. So just give me what I need to do and, and make me orthodox. And uh, my dad was kind of like that, but not really. He became a very, very strong orthodox. So how do we get them to, on fire for the faith? that it's not just some sort of stamp that they have to put down so they can go to take the next step. But there's something that they've been introduced to. It's, it's the opening. It's the, I love this word, the Anufungspunkt, good German word, putting the button in the buttonhole. How do we put that button into that buttonhole? The flybys, I get these all the time. They come, they show up at church, then you don't see them for months and months. And then they come and show up at church. And then you don't see them for months and months. And they just, you know, they flit in. You know, oh, Father, I'll be there. I'll be there. I, had, I have catechism classes on Thursday nights. I had 10 people who said they were going to be there for the catechism classes. We started them up two weeks ago. I'm yet to see any of those 10 people show up that promised. You know, okay, well, in God's time, they'll figure it out. So I don't lose sleep over that. The forevers. Who are the forevers? They are catechumens forever. In my father-in-law's parish, they had this one man. He was the, one of the most saintly men I've ever met, the best parishioner in the parish. And he had been there for 40 years and still hadn't been chrismated. <laughs> he was still, I got to still work it, out, work it out. He ended up being chrismated and becoming a monk, by the way. So, but, you know, that's okay on their time. When it happens, it'll happen. So uh, some people just want to take their time. Sometimes it's a lot to do with family. You know, they don't want to become Orthodox while their parents are alive because they don't want to disappoint them or whatever. So it's okay. And then we have the zealous. They're the ones that scare me. They come in full of knowledge. They've read everything. They've read the canons. They can tell you what you do wrong. And they are going to come in and tell you how to really be Orthodox. Usually you need to cut them off at the knees a little bit and kind of bring them back to earth. But you, you rejoice that they have such knowledge, but you need to channel it into a direction that is going to be something that's going to be positive on that. 
So I'm going to skip because I don't have that much time. So, so a few things. I don't know what I just did to this, but I did something weird. Um, anyway, just a few things. St. Innocent's instructions to the missionaries. If you ever had a chance to read them, it's one of the most amazing documents that were, was put out, put out. And it was put out before a cultural, uh, a contextual theology was even understood as contextual theology. In other words, how do you deal with people who are different than you? And I always give the students, they said, you need to read this and understand how St. Innocent was seeing this. So let me just give you a few things. First and foremost, St. Innocent says, start with prayer. Start with prayer. Everything you do needs to start with prayer. Second, he says, be of a modest and lowly spirit when you're instructing. For some of that's hard. Do not presume or expect extraordinary results. It'll be what it will be, whether you like it or don't like it. Um, do not begin without thought. In other words, think about what you're going to say before you say it. Good advice for life. Love alone creates. Love the people that God puts to you. Father Matusiak of blessed memory used to say, what does God want me to do with these people right here, right now? And that's the question you need to always be asking yourself. Use the same place for instruction so people get used to that. Be of comfort. Be a person of comfort to them. Vary the instruction according to the state of the mind and the age. So not everyone's going to have that same sort of level of catechism. Adjust it. And start from the very beginning. The most and single most important thing that we can do. Teach about salvation. Why we had a fall. Why we need a Christ. And what does Christ do for us? See, sometimes we're very good at making people orthodox. We're not so good at making people Christian. And we need to start at the very beginning. I, if I could save anything over the 26 years I've been as a priest, the thing I've, I've discovered the most, we need to reteach who and what Jesus Christ is. We need to teach what the Trinity is. We need to teach what we say in the creed. The things that we could have assumed, say, when I was a kid or Father Chad was a kid. Of course, they didn't have writing back then. They were still. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But the things that we assume people know, you can't anymore. People need to learn about who and what Jesus Christ is and why it's important in your life. People are looking for that. They are looking precisely what, for what we have. And so I, I have changed the way I've done catechism, and I do it. A lot of it is based on just that understanding. St. Innocent said in his instructions, he said, don't worry about teaching, I'm paraphrasing because he's much more elegant than I am. Uh, you know, don't worry about teaching about fasting and all this other stuff. That will come in time. They'll learn that. Teach them what it means to be a Christian and how the church leads them to Christ. And so my brothers and sisters, that's the critical part of what we do. We have people hungry for exactly what we have, and we have people who are looking for precisely what we have. I'm just going to have to skip through because I don't have much time. Um, Ten minutes. Okay. That's pretty good. I'm going to go right to my conclusion. How's that? Uh, I think, Sarah, you're going to make this, you can make the slides available for anybody who wants it. Okay. So you can, and they have all books, different types. Like how do you deal with people who are of a Protestant background? How do you have people who come from a Roman Catholic background? I have models of catechism in there. So you can look at that and I'll answer any of those questions, but I want to kind of go to some key points to kind of sum it up. As we bring people into the church and we should be receiving people in the church, there's a couple of very critical points. One, make sure you don't have a gatekeeper. Who's the gatekeeper? That's that person who, 
when that new person comes into church and they sit down, they say, well, that's my seat. <laughs> or they come, uh, well, who are you? You don't look Greek, you know, or something like that. That happened to, to one of my parishioners the other day, actually. Uh, and he's uh, not Greek, let's just put it that way. Um, so make sure that you have that. Also, that you always have someone in your parish. God always gives us these people. They have the gift of hospitality. That somehow they know how to greet people and make them feel comfortable. Make sure you have that person who can give them that gift of hospitality. Hey, welcome. Here's where you are. Here's a book if you want to follow along. If you have any questions, ask me. After liturgy, please come to coffee hour. And, and make sure when they come to coffee hour, people actually sit and talk to them. You know, it takes a lot of courage to walk into an Orthodox church for the first time. And if you're shunned, people are not going to come back. So make them feel welcome. Like, really. Um, don't ever point them out in the church. Oh, look, we have a new visitor today. Would you stand up? You know, that person wants to just, <laughs> you know, don't do that. They'll figure their own way. And, they'll f and, and again, it takes a lot of courage. So make sure you do that. Make sure that you have the right goal. The goal of bringing someone into the church is not to build up the numbers in the parish. That happens. The goal is to give them an, on a path to salvation. The goal is to make them into, you're not making them, God is making them, to bring them closer to Christ. That's the goal. And if God grants you one catechumen, wonderful. If he grants you 30 catechumens, wonderful. It doesn't matter. God would not send them there to set them up for failure. And so make sure we're part of that. Make sure you remind them that this is the end of their search. That eventually they're going to come to an end of a search. And the search and the fullness is found here in the church. And finally, and again, knowledge will come in time. You know, I mean, I, I always kind of chuckle as new catechumens are trying to navigate their first Lent and they're trying to get through this and we're doing all these weird things. And then they walk in and all of a sudden we're on the ground prostrating and they're like, what the heck is going on here? It's all good. Just be patient, explain it to them. They'll integrate, they'll gain the knowledge. Wait, Father, I have a new, new couple of new kids who we received and now they're serving the altar and they walked in church one week, it was red. Now they walk in and it's gold. They're like, what, what's going on here? Just go with it. It happens. We'll, we'll be changing colors. You'll, you'll figure it out. So make sure you do that. And most importantly, most importantly, make it joyful. Make joyful. We want joyful Christians. We don't want grumpy Christians. It doesn't make anybody happy. But if we have joyful Christians, my brothers and sisters, who are brought into the fullness of the church, integrated into the community of Christ, and given that opportunity to grow and to exercise their spiritual life within that community, our communities get healthier. And they grow. And they, be, they radiate with the joy of what we are and what we're supposed to be. And so I'm sorry I can't go through all the different things. I have limited time. But... This is just some comments. And this is, again, an example of some of the stuff that we talk about in, in seminary classes. And we try to help so that then when they go out there and start bringing in the harvest, they're doing it with a great joyful and loving heart. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Father Eric. Some years ago, I had the great privilege of being at a conference where the late Father Peter Gilquist was speaking, and he used the phrase that America is Orthodoxy's best kept secret. Okay, that gets repeated a lot in our Orthodox world. His Grace Bishop Basil of Wichita was sitting in the front, and Bishop Basil responded, thank God we're a secret because our house is such a mess, we aren't ready to receive guests. Well, that one's worth repeating too, okay? So part of what we're doing today is to help put the house in order so that we may receive guests. What you're hearing from the speakers today is there is a movement that's underfoot here 
And we Orthodox need to wake up and be prepared for receiving the guests. Our culture, our world is becoming more populated with people who are seekers and inquirers and soul searchers. They recognize that there is something missing in their lives and they want to find it, they're on a hunt. And we Orthodox have the treasure to give if we can just wake up long enough to figure out how it is we receive these gifts. We don't, by the way, have to go hunting for them. They're hunting for us. We're out fishing and they're jumping into the boats. So keep in mind as we move through the day that it's through the calling of ordinary, willing individuals that God is able to move and bring people, families, communities, and nations back to life. Through your faithful support, we at the seminary have been sending courageous priests willing to follow Jesus into the furthest and darkest places. It's your generosity that's ensuring the future of orthodoxy, the strength of individual parishes, and the ability to continue to send priests on missions to be the catalyst for the gospel until the whole world hears and knows the hope that is eternal and the light that will never grow dim. So again, we thank you for your participation today. We're all being educated. We can all be generous. And just one little thing about SVS Press. I like to repeat this. Every time you buy an SVS Press book, you're supporting a priest. Because last year, they, the, the profits we made from SVS Press contributed to the bottom line of the seminary at almost one quarter of the annual fund. That's the reason the press is, exists, to educate, but also every time you buy a product, you're supporting a future priest. Again, our thanks. <laughs> so my next job and final job for the day, no, not really, is to introduce Father Chad. So you've probably heard Father Chad allude that we're almost like family. So I'll tell you the story. So he knows the story. I might cry. Yes. So I was a priest in Las Vegas, and Father Chad was a priest in Salina, Kansas. And uh, we had adopted a boy from, from Russia, my son Alexander, when he was 19 months old. And Father Chad was doing a lot of work in Salina with uh, adoption. And he heard about this priest up in Las Vegas who would be interested in, in adopting a child. And so he contacted me. And we, that's how we first met by phone as we arranged the adoption of what we become my daughter. And we uh, first time I met him was in the hospital in Salina, Kansas, when we went to, to my daughter was 12 hours old and he held her before I got to hold her as he was there in, in, the, in the operating uh, the, uh, the hospital. And um, now my daughter is, 20, is 19 and in sophomore in college and uh, Father Chad, was the one who set up so that we can have her in our life. So uh, that's for family. So he always wants to hear how she's doing. So it's good. So thank you, Father Chad, for that. Father Chad, very Reverend Dr. Chad Hatfield is, of course, the president of St. Vladimir Seminary. And he's held that position for five years. And he formerly served as the seminary CEO and chancellor for the previous 10. He served as the Dean of St. Herman Seminary in Kodiak, Alaska, where at that time, him and I were, were doing Department of Evangelism stuff. So we'd have, be on the phone between Alaska and Las Vegas as we were trying to figure out what we were gonna do in the church. Um, administer it, in addition to his administrative roles, Father Chad teaches pastoral theology and missiology. He was the editor of the St. Vladimir's Press Profile Series and Missiology Series, which we're gonna have some more stuff coming out soon on that. Um, the latest publication ed by him features the personality work of Patriarch Daniel of Romania. And Father Chad is the member of the OCA Board of Theological Education, the Mission Institute at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, and the Advisory Council for Christian Bioethics, and the International Orthodox Theological Association. He is also the co-chair of the OCA and the Anglican Church in North America Dialogue. He's been honored with the St. Macrina Award for Excellence in Education from St. Vladimir's, the Distinguished Alumni Award from the Shoda House, and the St. John Chrysostom Cross and Award for Excellence in Theological Education from the Romanian Patriarch and the Sanguin Sanguinian Cross by Metropolitan Laurentiu of Romania. 
He holds two honorary degrees from the New Georgia University and the Republic of Georgia and the Shota House in Wisconsin. Father Chad has been an incredible administrator, an educator, mission priest. He's served as a mission priest in South Africa, all over the place. We love exchanging stories. We are gifted. God has gifted him to us and to this church. And we thank God for his work in the field. So with that, I will introduce Father Chad because we have to keep him humble. Well, as you can tell from that introduction, I get around a lot. That helps me to keep one step ahead of the creditors. So there we go. Okay. Well, this really is a, a delight to be able to share this information, this day with you today, because it is so incredibly important. If I was to write a book about orthodoxy, not just in America, but globally, I would call it missed opportunities. There are so many moments in our Orthodox history where we, we had something presented to us, like God given, a movement of the Holy Spirit, and somehow or another we missed it. We Orthodox are good at a couple of things that we need to get over. One of them is we're not future driven. We always look back. We're always very proud of our past. We're very proud of our history and we're oriented this way. We need to get oriented this way, okay, for the future. The other thing is we Orthodox cannot properly identify the enemy. We think we are the enemy. You wanna talk about fights, disputes, and silly arguments, it's all inter-Orthodox. It's ridiculous. So we've got to figure out who the enemy is. It's not our different ethnic group down the street or converts versus cradle born or whatever that happens to be. All of that is, is something that was planned in hell and the demons release it and it's a constant distraction for us. You can look at the title of this talk. It is with a coming storm. There is a coming storm and we need to be awake. We need to be prepared and the voices are getting louder and louder and there's a cacophony of them trying to get our attention. If we Orthodox could just wake up and pay attention and recognize that we're hiding the talents. Scripture has told us come the day of judgment. We aren't looking so good at this point because we've hid them in the ground. The coming storm, the fields are turning white for harvest. I'm bouncing off of Father Eric. Again, it's the scriptures that are telling us the Lord God himself is saying, the harvest is turning white for the harvest. Be prepared. So we're hearing all kinds of signs around us trying to get our attention. Now, one of the things that I do uh, for a side job is I sell books. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I've been plugging for SVS Press, but I have a few other books that I'm going to call your attention to today. It's all part of what is out there that we need to be paying attention to in order to fulfill the mission that we have been given. It is a mission that is dominical, and that means it is of the Lord. There is the Great Commission in Scripture. We are to go forth and baptize all nations. We're to go forth teaching them all that we have been given, share from the great treasury, in other words. When Archbishop Anastasios of Albania, one of the foremost missiologists of our time, was speaking at St. Vladimir's a few years ago, I thought it was important for my Alaskan students to hear him, so I found the shekels and I got some of my students down to New York and that was the first time I personally heard Archbishop Anastasio say, a church that is not engaged in mission is simply not the church. I've expanded that because the truth of the matter is, a Christian not engaged in mission is simply not a Christian. Our faith is not something that's personal. Our faith is something that is by design is to be shared. And the design really is the sanctity and holiness of our lives, that we bear the light of Christ that is within us into an ever darkening world. 
And it's the ever darkening world that's trying to get our attention, okay? We talk about the rise of secularism all the time. It's in our press. The world would like us to believe that secularism is on the rise, that it's a triumph. The world would like us to believe that Christianity is diminishing and Islam is on the rise. I'm gonna pause because I'm watching the clock, but I can't resist this. I was a missionary in South Africa with my family for five years until the South African government decided to kick me out. Oh, it was great. Um, but I was once in Malawi, and those of you that know the uh, African continent know that Malawi is a very peaceful little country. I was on a lake, like right in the middle of the continent. I was there, I'm determined to knock that off, you know. I was there visiting other missionaries, and I went for a walk, and I sat next to an elder, a Malawian elder, beautiful black face, beautiful white hair, great contrast. And he knew that I was an Mfunzi, a priest. And so he played me and I took the bait, okay? He said, oh, you, you Christians, you missionaries. And now he says, we have the Imams and the Muslims. He said, those of us who are animus, you know, traditional belief, he says, you make it so hard for us. So again, I'm being very serious. I said, so what's so difficult? He said, no, no. He says, the Imams come and, and they, they say to us, oh, um, you can keep multiple wives, but you can't drink. Tough choice, he said. Then he says, you Christians, you can only have one wife, but you can drink. Really tough choice you guys are giving us, okay? Well, my point is, it is on the African continent where we actually are seeing the biggest explosion, the growth of Christianity, but also with Islam. So in fact, this is a time in which we're seeing different messages that are being given, and we need to sort out who's telling us the truth. Because in the American media, they like to bomb us with facts and statistics, and they got all the Christian world's hearts pulsing just in the past year when a survey came out that said for the first time in American history, more people did not identify as a Christian than ever. We dropped below the 50% mark. We were somewhere near 48%. Oh my gosh, everybody got all panicked, you know. Christianity's disappearing, it's going to hell, all of this stuff. And then, of course, so much in recent years has been built around the Pew Survey that gave us two new words in the religious language, nuns and duns, N-O-N-E-S, okay? The nuns, they're defined as people who, when they fill out a survey, indicate they have no religious affiliation. They are identified with none, okay? And then you have the duns, and the duns are those that used to be religious, but they aren't anymore, okay? We need to be paying attention to how this is presented to us, okay? Because the truth of the matter is, those nuns really do have a religious heart that's beating. They're part of the seekers. It's not that they have none, it means that they're looking. The duns are not finished, it's just that they're walking away from a Christianity, which again, forgive me for sounding critical, has so identified with the zeitgeist, that's a nice German word, which means the spirit of the age, that in fact, I believe it was Lord Acton who said, he who weds the zeitgeist soon finds himself a widower because it's changing and passing in different directions all of the time. And people indicate in so many ways that the kind of religious expression they're looking for is centered around the word authenticity. And Father Eric actually identified that in his talk. People are looking for an anchor, something that is solid and something that is real. So if we give them locale theology, and if we identify with every kind of movement in the zeitgeist, because golly, we don't want to challenge people, we might chase them off or something like that. No, people want to be challenged. And particularly the younger generations, they're testing us for authenticity and they are testing us for strength. Here's an interesting fact from the American prison system. Do you know the fastest growing religion amongst men in the American prison system? It's Islam, okay? 
Now, do you think Islam's a pansy religion? No. It's very clear, it's very direct, it's very simple, but it is demanding. These men in prison are very much attracted to it. Fastest growing religion amongst women in the American prison system. You know what it is? Wiccanism, witchcraft, because it empowers them in a way that they find satisfying and it is challenging. Again, Witchcraft is not something you want to take lightly in your life, right? Okay, It's not a, something you do a couple hours on a Sunday morning. It becomes your identity, your life. Orthodoxy is intended to be just that. It's not your religion of choice. It is who you are. It is how you live your life. And yes, it is very, very demanding. Very demanding. So people are looking. So here we go with the books. Okay, you're with me so far? Check myself. There we go. Oh, I'm 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 okay. Good. We knew that, right? <laughs> this is a book called Strange Rights by Tara Isabella Burton. Okay. It's a remarkable read. Now, I don't agree with everything that she's got in here, but she certainly gets my attention and she should get yours. Rod Dreher, which is a, a name that if you're not familiar with, you should be familiar with. He's one of the endorsers on the back, and I just want to read what he has to say about this book titled Strange Rights. He says, with Strange Rights, Tara Isabella Burton establishes herself as her generation's foremost chronicler of American religious life. Her intelligence, her immersed reporting, and her vivid prose style illuminate with particular intensity the radical religious changes, changes of for post-Christian America. I'm gonna pause at that point. I actually disagree with Rod. I think we're not living in a post-Christian era. I believe we're living in an aggressively anti-Christian cultural time. It's moved beyond that. But Rod continues, the religious center has not held. That's where, again, it depends upon how you look at this. The traditional Christian Judeo center has not held. Burton is an essential guide to the mere spiritual anarchy now loosed upon the spiritual world. That's a significant phrase because we are certainly living in a time of spiritual anarchy. It's chaos. So Strange Rights, he predicts, will doubtless be one of the most important books of the year. It was published in 2021. Okay. So Tara Isabella Burton. One of the things that I was introduced to here is her understanding of the nuns. And she points out this fact about nuns. 46% of those nuns talk to God or the, this highest power regularly. And 13% say that God talks back. 48% of them think that a higher power has protected them throughout life. 41% say that it has rewarded them. 28% say it has punished them. 46% experience a sense of spiritual peace and well-being at least once a week, a percentage that actually increased by five points between 2007 and 2014. 47% believe in the presence of spiritual energies in physical objects. 46% believe in psychics, 38% in reincarnation, 32% in astrology, and 62% it turns out in at least one of these four. That does not sound like a growing constituency of atheist non-believers. So in other words, our nuns may not be traditionally religious in the sense that either say Jerry Falwell uh, used to be, but they're not exactly secular either. So the story of the rise of the religious nuns in America, it turns out really isn't about nuns at all. Rather, it's about three distinct complicated groups of people whose spiritual lives, sense of meaning, community, and rituals are a blend of what you might call traditional religious practices and personal institutional spirituality. Most of this is based around a sense of feelings and experiences. Well, she introduces me to a word which is the remixed. 
And the remixed are a very fast growing group in American society. So what are remixes? Well, before I answer that, I wanna do my own survey. How many of you sitting here today, or those of you who are just saying virtual, you can raise your hand too. How many of you have friends, relatives, co-workers who have said to you at some point in the last few years, you know, I'm really not religious, but I'm spiritual. A pretty high percentage of you, okay? That's one of those things which we Orthodox better wake up to and recognize. We're buying the false media projection that we are becoming more and more a culture of educated non-believers. Not true. It's just that they're walking away from what they have experienced as something leaving them unfulfilled. And orthodoxy is the full treasure chest. We have it if we can learn how to appreciate it and learn how to share it. So strange rights. Another person whom I have an enormous amount of respect for is a religious sociologist at Baylor University. His name is Rodney Stark. You can Google him, he's got a multitude of publications. Rodney Stark took on that Pew survey that gave us the terms nuns and duns a few years ago. He said as a sociologist, it was a damn poor survey. They didn't do it correctly. And he said they didn't find out what is in fact the truth. So he wrote a book recently, which is titled, Why the World is More Religious Than Ever, The Triumph of Faith. But it's really a shocker because he is demonstrating that the so-called normal Judeo-Christian world that we took so much comfort in and it was just routine in our lives has in fact failed. It's not retaining people, people are moving out, but people haven't embraced a certain kind of cold atheism at all. But they're looking, they're looking, they're looking for something. And one of the things that is demonstrated here are some, again, sorry to throw stats at you, but it's good to hear them because it's a wake-up call, as I said, for us. One of the things that, that Stark has found in his own poll, and also this backed up by some Gallup polls, is some things that we see from Europe. Now, everybody talks about poor Western Europe is gone, you know, large, beautiful cathedrals and churches built by previous generations that are basically museums and ways that they get their, their shekels from tourists coming through and dropping some coins in a box. Very interesting, okay? Western Europe. In Austria, the most recent surveys show that 28% of the respondents say they believe in fortune tellers. Now, you see, we're being told the more educated we become, the less religious we become. Not true. Here's an interesting little stat about that, by the way. If you actually were to see who is the most active participants in a mosque these days, they're not the undereducated. They're the very highly educated. So again, that's a false fallacy that all you need to get people away from religion is education. Even with Karl Marx, that one failed. So sophisticated Roman Catholic Austria, 28% believe in fortune tellers. 32% believe in astrology, and 33% believe in lucky charms. More than 20% of Swedes believe in reincarnation. And Stark writes, half in, the, in mental telepathy. More, this is the one, this is the one that I just love, okay? I wanna pause, make a commentary here, okay? Iceland, beautiful country, highly educated. Okay, most people are bilingual there for sure, speaking Icelandic, English. Okay, so we're told, get educated, you walk away from your religion. Well, that's true. Largely Lutheran, almost exclusively Lutheran. So the Lutheran participation has diminished considerably. But they've picked up all kinds of weird, strange spirituality. And the survey showed that now half, there are about 300,000 people in Iceland. Half of them have re-embraced a belief in Hulda folk. Do you know what Hulda folk are? Exactly. They're little people. They're leprechauns, fairies, and sprites, and all the rest, okay? So if you're attracted to live in Iceland, I can tell you there's a hot job market 
for people who can identify where the Hulda folk live and can communicate with the Hulda folk. And a hot job is when they're developing Iceland, these people who are paid really well, better than me, go out and survey the land where they're proposing to build. And if the Hulda folk tell them, don't build here, we're living here and you'll mess up our little kingdom, you can't build. This is in sophisticated, educated Iceland. Again, Rodney Stark over and over just simply shows us that this is not a shift towards non-belief and atheism. He keeps demonstrating over and over and over what it is that we, 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 we are looking for. We are looking for something that is indeed a spiritual answer to what St. Augustine would say, the void that we're all born with, that we spend our lives trying to jam everything but God into, and we find ourselves unfulfilled, not completed. So Stark says, in other words, there is a decrease in nominal affiliation, not an increase in irreligion. So whatever else it may reflect this identification of nuns and duns, the change does not support the claim for increased secularization, let alone a decrease in the number of Christians. It may not even reflect an increase in those who say they are nuns. The reason has to do with response rates and the accuracy of the surveys. The other thing that Stark found in his own work and along with his associates at Baylor is that the so-called young people who are walking away in droves from traditional Christianity and they are, they are embracing all kinds of, of uh, changes in social norms in America, he demonstrates really not very true. It may be as low as 11%. But as much as 50% identify that they are still looking for this authentic religion, something that is solid, unchanging, and anchor in their lives. Okay? So I think we've got that part established, right? So that's the point. A couple of other things. One of the declines that I'm going to, I'm going to cite for you, again, shows us that we don't wanna go in particular directions. I think we've demonstrated that dumbing down our faith is not the way to go. Here's one quick statistic. I saw it only this past week from the UK. The Church of England, which is a state church, if, there, if the trajectory according to this survey, and by the way, it's a church survey, it's not somebody from the outside looking in, shows that at their current rate of decline, the Church of England will simply disappear by the year 2055. That's how low the participation rate has become in the Church of England. Now that's a wake up call for us. We can't sit here in this American cultural environment when we Orthodox are maybe if we're honest 1% of the US population and pretend that somehow we'll be fed by immigrants from the old country and that's going to sustain us. We've got to be able to engage this culture. St. Innocent was quoted earlier by Father Eric. I'm going to quote him too. St. Innocent said, he was tormented, by the way, by, by other Russians when the U.S. bought Alaska. It's quite a deal for us too, by the way. 1865, Seward's Folly. Some Russians went to torment him. And they said, isn't this a great tragedy what's happened? He said, no, it's not a tragedy. It's an opportunity. And that's when he said, in order to plant orthodoxy in the rest of North America, we needed to do three things. We needed to recruit men for the priesthood from the local population, train them in local seminaries, not send them abroad, and to teach and preach in the language the people understand. Now, I think that's more than speaking in the local language, like English or French or Spanish or whatever it happens to be. I think today, that means we've got to learn how to communicate through modern means, every aspect of social media, whatever way that people are getting their information. And the church is always about 25 years behind the times in such arenas. 
We've got to get modern and to catch up. So I'm gonna skate out on a limb here, okay? It's not the first time I've done this. I'm gonna repeat for you what I repeated for seminarians. There is what's called the, the OIS, uh, uh, OISM, Orthodox Interseminary Movement. These are seminarians in all of the US seminaries. They contacted me and said, okay, we're doing little short YouTubes um, of people that can tell us as students of theology what the world will be like that we're going into, okay? Fine, great, they asked me, so I did. And I identified in my little talk, and that talk's gotten a lot of hits. I believe, and I have not changed my mind, within North American Orthodoxy, there are really three major movements that are happening, and we're not recognizing it in the spheres in which it needs to be recognized. Our leadership, I'm gonna just leave it at that, have not picked up on the fact there are these three movements underfoot. One of my jobs at the seminary is to try and always keep the academy, the seminary, in touch with the grassroots. If we lose contact with what's happening in the parishes that we are called to serve, we're in trouble. If we become isolated, ivory tower academia, out of touch with the battles, the spiritual warfare on the ground, we're in trouble, okay? So we work hard at that at St. Vladimir's. These are the three movements I believe are happening that we need to pay some attention to. The first is the Benedict movement. It's been made popular by Rod Dreher's book, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation. The Benedict movement is based around what St. Benedict did when Rome collapsed. He went to the hills, not to hide, not to create like Amish communities, but he went back so he could have a safe place to regroup and then re-enter the fallen empire to re-evangelize. That's the point. This was picked up by Pope Benedict XVI as well. Pope Benedict said certain things again that are picked up in this book. He said he expects the church of the future will be smaller, but more committed. I think that that's probably where we're headed as well. Because again, in the scriptures, we're told there's going to be a testing and not all will stand. So what Rod Dreher is putting forward here is a call for Christians, particularly to take fact, to take the facts, look at them and say, we need to regroup, reconnect, find what one might call a realignment of Christendom across denominational lines. And for those who embrace the fullness of the gospel and take Jesus Christ as Lord, we need to be talking to each other and supporting each other and not warring with each other. We need to find the space and particularly in the education systems to take control of our children's lives and know what it is that they're being fed in education to prepare all of us for the time in which we re-evangelize this now post-Christian or anti-Christian culture. That's one, the Benedict movement. The second movement I call the Constantine movement. That's centered largely around people like John Mark Reynolds at the St. Constantine School in Houston, Texas, which is franchising and is planting schools in Pittsburgh and Dallas and other places all over the country. Take a look across American Orthodoxy at how many of our parishes are scraping to put together the founding of parochial schools. Once again, classical school education, the homeschool movement along with homeschool academies. It's telling us something and we need to be awake. Again, I'm gonna skate right out on thin ice, I don't mind. I think we Orthodox are lousy at education. Look at what we've done in this country, it's pathetic. We can't really find a strong undergraduate program for Orthodox teenagers. When I dropped both of my boys off at the University of Kansas, both times I thought, my God, I've sent them to Babylon. And all we can do as parents is to hope and pray that we've given them enough of a foundation that they can pass through Babylon, which is required of them, it seems, in the culture. The St. Constantine movement is saying, we will win back by education. Two movements. The third one I call the accommodationist movement. The accommodation movement are those who are embracing the zeitgeist full bore 
and are saying, we need to alter and change orthodoxy, dumb it down so it's not so hard, not so challenging, and we need to get with the program, okay? Well, that's what the Church of England did, and you've seen the results. So I've said that's not a good option to be following, okay? So I need to end on some good news, right? Now that I've got your attention with all the bad news. The good news is something that Father Eric noted. I've been tracking this for over a year now. So many of our recent graduates of St. Vladimir's and some of the old time graduates, but especially the young guys who are often in newer missions in different parts of the country, especially across the South and the West, but not limited there by any means. Father Eric is in the Northeast. He's just described to you what's happening in his parish. There is a movement that's drawing people to Orthodox churches that's shocking some priests. And I'm trying to coordinate and have conversation with people in departments and in parishes to try and find some answers. I don't have them yet, but we're seeing parishes with the largest groups of catechumens they've ever seen in their history. One priest on the West Coast had 66 baptisms at Pascha in his parish. I spoke there in May at a conference on the Mother of God. He already had 20 new catechumens. I said, can you explain it? He gave me some answers of where they're finding direction. I've done this over and over. I've repeated it over and over. You'll see it in the fall appeal from St. Vladimir's. Those of you that get it, another interview with a priest in Allen, Texas. It just goes on and on. So it just simply underscores, verifies the facts that we're seeing here. People are looking. Go into any major bookseller and go to the section that's labeled spirituality or religion or self-help. It's usually the largest section in the bookstore. They wouldn't be selling those books if they weren't making money. And look at what people are embracing. You think hold the folks funny? These people are serious and they're paying good money for these books so they can discover the hold the folk. Here's the other thing after you do that, I challenge you, look in that major section for one single book about the Orthodox Church. Most likely you'll search in vain. We got to correct these sorts of things. So why are these people knocking on our doors and they're coming, okay? Again, I'm going out on thin ice, but I'm just repeating what people are telling me who are active in parishes and have these large catechumen classes. Who's drawing these people and pointing them during this 20 months of COVID that we've had? Because people are on social media, they have time, they're thinking about their own mortality. It's a whole different ball game now with this pandemic. The names they give me are Rodrer, okay? High profile out there. People say, oh, I don't agree with him on this or that. Well, you don't have to but people are discovering orthodoxy through this man, okay? The other one um, is uh, Jonathan Pujol. How many of you know Jonathan Pujol? Okay, the young hands went up, okay? You old geezers, you gotta do what I'm doing. I'm introducing myself to Jonathan Pujol. It's all about beauty, okay? People are discovering, we live in a dark, ugly, nasty world. I'm looking for something beautiful in my life. They're discovering orthodoxy, okay? Jordan Peterson, who's not even a Christian. All these people are being told, go find an orthodox church. They go to find it. This is the one that's most puzzling to me. And I had a good conversation with my friend Warren Farha, who owns Eight Day Books in Wichita, Kansas, just this past week. He verified for me what I'm hearing from other priests. Teenagers, I mean 20 under, okay, a significant portion of them have discovered orthodoxy on their own, largely from irreligious, non-religious families by stumbling onto Seraphim Rose. Okay, how many of you know Seraphim Rose? Yeah, okay. Well, this comes as a big kind of surprise for me, but when I look at what I see in the prison system and other such things, Maybe it's not such a surprise, but as teenagers do, those of us that have raised children, they test us and they're looking again for authenticity. So Sarah from Rose is a challenge. 
It's a projection of the world and a presentation of orthodoxy that's not easy. It's a challenge. And I've had more than one priest say that they have teenagers who are now part of the catechumen groups. Their parents drive them to church, leave them, go have coffee, read the paper, come back and pick up their kids. This is a movement that's happening not in small numbers, but in large numbers across the scene. So I leave you with that. These are challenging times, complicated times. It's a wake up call for us, but there is indeed incredible hope on the horizon. So let's pay attention, stop fighting amongst ourselves, learn who the enemy is, and let's present this glorious faith and bring the light of Christ, as I said, into a world that seems to be growing ever more darkly. Thank you for your time. We'll have some Q&A time here. You can take me on, by the way. I don't mind that at all. Or you can correct me if I've made some errors, but we'll have that time for Q&A. So. Okay. Well, now it gives me... Oh, we're going to have a break now, right? See there? It's like the Ever Ready Bunny. I just keep charging on there, you know, watching the clock. All right. So we've got a, a five-minute five break. That's not enough for old people. So we'll say, <laughs> we'll, say, we'll say five minutes, but we really mean 10. Okay, great. <laughs>
We've reached the time now for the much anticipated keynote address of the day. Dr. Bradley Nassif is the leading world expert on the dialogue of the Orthodox Church with evangelical Protestant traditions, according to Father John McGuckin at Oxford University. Brad graduated from St. Vladimir Seminary and has been a consultant for the New York Times, Christianity Today, and a pioneer of Orthodox evangelical dialogue in the United States, the World Council of Churches, and the Lausanne Orthodox Initiative. He has been a visiting professor at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology and the Patriarch Athena Goris Orthodox Institute. Over the past 30 years, he has introduced Orthodoxy to Protestant evangelical students at Fuller Seminary, where he was director of academic programs, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, Regent College, Denver Seminary, Northern Baptist Seminary, Southern Baptist Seminary, and North Park University. He team taught a course on orthodoxy and evangelicalism in dialogue with Dr. J.I. Packer, one of evangelicalism's most influential theologians of the 21st century. This, of course, is available through Regent Publishing. Brad is co-editor of the Philokalia, a classic text of Orthodox spirituality published by Orthodox University Press. He's editor of New Perspectives on Historical Theology, Essays in Memory of John Meindorf, which is published by Erdmans. His, and we should note, by the way, that Father John Meindorf was his doctoral mentor, and I believe maybe his last doctoral student before his repose. He's authored Bringing Jesus to the Desert, published by Zondervan. He is a son of St. Mary's Orthodox Church in Wichita, Kansas, and an active member of Holy Transfiguration Antiochian Orthodox Church in Warrenville, Illinois. So Dr. Nassif, we welcome you and anxiously await the keynote address. Thank you, Father Chad. I want to uh, begin by thanking Father Grama and uh, for the gracious hospitality of this uh, lovely parish. I'd also like to uh, thank Alex and Sarah for their fine preparation for this work. I know they've put a lot of effort into it, so I'm very glad uh, for that. Is, are you able to hear me back there? Can you, coming through, fine, good. You know, uh, Talking about the subject and writing about the subject of orthodoxy and evangelicalism reminds me of the story of a rich Texas rancher. He uh, had a party and he invited everybody over and he said, uh, in my swimming pool are some sharks. And if anybody can swim across that pool and get there safely, I will give you $1 million. <clears throat> no sooner did he say it and splash. Some man jumped into the water and he was swimming like crazy to get to the other side. He got out of the other side and uh, the rich young, the rich rancher went to him and he said, I can't believe it. You actually did it. I'm going to give you a million dollars. The man says, no, I don't want the million dollars. And the rancher was uh, stunned. He said, well, uh, let me give you half of my ranch. And he said, no, I don't want half of my ranch. He said, well, I've got to do something for you. Let me give you my daughter in marriage. He said, no, I don't want my daughter in marriage, your daughter in marriage either. He said, well, what do you want? He said, all I want is the name of that guy that pushed me into the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the subject of orthodoxy and evangelicalism can be very risky for an author. Uh, there are human sharks out there, both orthodox and evangelical kinds, that can attack a person who tries to swim in these infected waters, infested waters. William Abraham, uh, Billy, as he's called, uh, the director of the Wesley House of Studies at Baylor University, made the following observation, quote, 
Sorting out the relationship between orthodoxy and evangelicalism can be a spiritual and intellectual nightmare. Often it looks like both sides have crashed at the red light and neither side wants to leave the scene of the accident. And then he endorses the book. <coughs> what I would like to do in introducing this book that I have written is to uh, allow you to get to know me a little bit because as we all know, writing can be biographical and that's really the case with me. Um, much of this book comes out of my personal experience over the last uh, 50 years, really, I suppose. <clears throat> and so what I want to do is to take a few moments to let you get to know me a little bit uh, and why it is I've written this book. Then I want to talk to you more directly about the book, tell you what it's not, what it is, what the goals and outcomes are, and then introduce you to the two parts, part one, part two. Part one focuses on the Orthodox tradition itself, and then part two, we'll talk about orthodoxy and evangelicalism in dialogue. So I don't want you to get to the idea that this is just about orthodoxy and evangelicalism. The first half of the book really is about the gospel in the orthodox tradition, which is really a heartbeat of concern for mine. And uh, then in part two, what I want to do is to tell you about not only an academic kind of comparison between orthodoxy and the intellectual strand of evangelicalism, but also what's happening some, in some very exciting venues around the world since 1990 to now in terms of, of uh, uh, orthodox and evangelical dialogue, especially the work of the Lausanne Orthodox Initiative. I will say more about that at the very end of my talk. This is a very exciting group uh, and a very particular group of uh, academics, theologians, as well as missiologists. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. So let me begin with just a few words about my upbringing and my family. Um, I am Lebanese in my cultural heritage. My grandmother and grandfather came from Lebanon in the early 1900s, and they ended up in Wichita, Kansas of all places. Well, that's where they came from, little villages and ended up there. So the earliest early influences on me came from my family and my church there in Wichita. Uh, this was an in immigrant period now in those days. Uh, the liturgy was done almost completely in Arabic, so I really didn't understand much of the liturgy at all. Um, and some of the priests that we got from the, well, to us, the old country, some of them were very good. Others were, well, they were just out of the seminary and uh, we're lucky, we were lucky in those days to get a priest. And um, sometimes the preaching wasn't exactly what it is now under the current priest, Father Aaron, who does a fine job there at St. Mary's, wonderful man, wonderful church uh, as well. But I remember when I was a student at Friends University nearby, I came across a fellow student and she was a Quaker. And she told me, oh, did you know? She said, do you go to that church? I said, yes, I do. She said, well, I write the, I write the sermons for the priests there. <laughs> so he was paying her to write the sermon. So we had a, 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 a Quaker woman writing the sermons. That was what it was like back then. But uh, he was a very fine, all of them were lovely people. They, whatever they lacked in, in uh, their uh, training was certainly made up for by their love. So I grew up, what I'm trying to say is I didn't have a clear understanding of the gospel. When I was a senior in high school though, uh, things changed. I was ordained as a subdeacon by Archbishop Philip, I mean, Archbishop Michael Shaheen in those days. And I was very young. I was 16 years old. Now, that's not a canonical age, but it gives, it gives you the, the idea of what was needed in those days. And so he got the patriarch's blessing, and I was ordained as a subdeacon. I went to church every Sunday, went, helped the, and was basically a good person, read the Gospels, I mean, read the epistle, helped behind the altar, did whatever I could. But quite honestly, I was religious, but lost. I had religion but I didn't have a relationship with God. And uh, that changed when I was a senior in high school. And that really uh, made a big difference. Now, when that 
awakening occurred in me when I was 17 years old. Uh, the priest at that time uh, was a new man, and uh, it was Father Anthony Sabah, and he was from Syria, and he had a much, he was very positive about my personal conversion experience, if you want to call it that. Uh, it was an awakening of my baptismal experience when I was just a child. And he took me under his wing and was very affirming. I went throughout the week at his home, and we would talk about the Bible. He would answer my questions, and he was very supportive. His wife, Minerva, was a model of a priest's wife. She was lovely, a wonderful support for him, and made the absolute best Lebanese food you can imagine. <laughs> Sometimes I went over the house just to have dinner with him. Well, I went on. Uh, from there, what my educational experience was uh, that I have had training uh, in both Orthodox and Evangelical uh, worlds. I did my bachelor's degree in religion and philosophy at Friends University in Wichita. I didn't really know. It was just close to the house. It was a Quaker university. And I went there because it was home, uh, close to home, and I majored in the Bible and uh, religion and philosophy. I met, Orthodox, I met Christians, non-Orthodox Christians, who loved God and loved the Bible and were serious about their study of the Bible. After there, I went to Denver Seminary and did a degree in New Testament uh, literature and exegesis, and I had several years of New Testament Greek. Here I was introduced to an intellectual tradition of evangelicalism, and I think that's important for us to be aware of. You have the evangelicalism in the pew, but then you have a sophisticated tradition of evangelicalism of the seminary. And uh, some of the people went to very distinguished academic institutions. And so I was introduced to the intellectual world of evangelicalism. And I studied not only the New Testament at Denver, I also studied Western church history and quite a lot of systematic theology as well. So I learned all those important uh, things that are important to evangelicalism about Arminianism and Calvinism and uh, the different systems of theology. So uh, this influenced me quite a lot. And as I studied church history, lights went on uh, about my own Orthodox background. Now, there was a time when I stepped away from the church for a few years because I was trying to draw closer to God and I worshiped in evangelical circles. As I said, I really didn't have a very good understanding of orthodoxy when I was younger, and uh, that came gradually. So, but when I was at Denver, things changed for me, and it was really in one of my church history classes taught by uh, Dr. Tim Weber, who, uh, when he went through the fourth century and talked about the Nicene Creed, these things uh, changed quite a bit, and lights went on. I said, oh my goodness, that's what I've been saying all these years. So that really uh, uh, put me right back into the church, and that's where I have been ever since. After that, I went to uh, Wichita State University and did a second master's degree in European history. I studied Russian history and traveled to the Soviet Union in uh, 1981, went to Moscow, Kiev, Leningrad, and Zagorsk, and it was during the dark days of communism under President Brezhnev. And that was quite an experience. I could tell you lots of stories about uh, communism in Russia in those days. Uh, then I went for my third master's degree at Ma in uh, St. Vladimir's. And uh, when I went to St. Vladimir's, I was coming from this background of evangelicalism, uh, the intellectual phrases of it. And I went through the seminary with different phases of questioning. Uh, now that was almost 40 years ago. I was very young at that time and immature, I would say. I think I was on the immature side, not as emotionally or spiritually mature as I wish that I was in those days. That's not to say that I'm fully mature now, but uh, I am older and in a different place than when I was as a young man in my early 20s. And uh, the great people that were there at that time were Father John Meyendorf. Alexander Schmemann, Father Tom Hopko, and Serge Verhofskoy. So those were, the, those were the Orthodox people that influenced my thinking. And of that group, the man who made the greatest impact on me was Father John Meyendorf. 
And I, I loved him so much, and I could tell that I was in the presence of a very uh, great man. People like him don't come around very often. And so when they do, I said, well, this is a man I need to learn from. So I followed him around like a puppy. Everything he offered, I was there, whether it was for credit or whether it was for simply uh, auditing. So I had a ton of courses with him. Three courses in those days on the survey of patristics from the second to the 14th century. Two, canon, two courses in canon law, three courses in church, Orthodox church history, and then specialty subjects like Christology in the fourth and fifth centuries, post-Chalcedonian Christology in the East, tradition in the fathers of the early church, authority in the early church, topics in Russian Christianity, Russian Orthodoxy, all that and more. So uh, I never seem to uh, uh, stop asking questions. I was always asking questions. And uh, Father John, I remember in one of the history classes, stopped the, the, the uh, I wasn't plugging, I wasn't pushing him on him, I just had questions. And so I remember once he stopped and he said, you know, you students, you need to listen to Nassif over here. He says he never asked a stupid question. And so I always took that to heart and I was very encouraged by that. I did my doctoral work under Father John. I believe I was his last doctoral student at Fordham University. Fordham is a Roman Catholic school. He was in the history department. I was in the theology department, but he was my doctoral mentor. So my dissertation was on St. John Chrysostom's New Testament homilies, especially in the school of Antioch, Syria, which is where I, of course, uh, grew up in the, in the Antiochian church. So my dissertation work was on uh, Antiochian exegesis, especially theoria. Now, um, I was married to my dear wife, Barbara, uh, at the end of my doctoral work. She was doing a Master of Divinity degree at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School at the time. She was not Orthodox when we got married. About five years after our marriage, she became Orthodox. She was interested. What attracted her was the spirituality of the church. And after I had gone through all that education, wow, I look back, it was 15 years of education. I look back and I realized that the evangelicals, the intellectual evangelicals really didn't understand orthodoxy. And I also realized that the orthodox really didn't understand the intellectual tradition of evangelicalism. So I thought, well, uh, you know, what might be helpful is to build a bridge between these two for simply mutual dialogue and edification, not necessarily to convert the other, but just to build the bridge. Now that was a difficult thing in those days, and we're talking about the 19, late 80s, 90s, the ice was cold. I mean, it was, the relations were very cold between the two and they sort of sneered at one another, not openly, but you know, privately, there's you know, those ignorant evangelicals or you know, who are the Orthodox? You had that kind of thing. So um, I decided that we should start an organization called the Society for the Study of Orthodoxy and Evangelicalism. And so I founded this organization, organization but not just me, others as well. And one of them was uh, Dr. Jim Stamoulis. Jim has written this fine book called Eastern Orthodox Mission Theology, which is still a classic. And he is a dear friend. He was a Greek Orthodox who became a Baptist, and yet he still loved his Orthodox roots and is very friendly and affirming of our tradition. In fact, we met over Jim's house when we started this organization, and uh, on his kitchen table, he likes telling the story of how we engraved our names or something like that on his table. Uh, he was the dean of the graduate school at Wheaton College. So we had our society meetings, several annual society meetings, in Wheaton at the Billy Graham Center because Jim had the keys to the house. So that's where we met. And we had some fine Orthodox and Evangelical speakers, the Orthodox Father Ted Stylianopoulos mm -hmm. from Holy Cross, Emmanuel Clapsis, Father Michael Procurette, and others. On the Evangelical side, we had uh, Kenneth Conser, Grant Osborne, uh, uh, Harold O.J. Brown, and eventually J.I. Packer. And Father uh, Ed Rahman, too, a fine Orthodox uh, man, was also in our 
circle of conversation. So um, it was after that that I began to uh, also teach non-Orthodox students about evangelicals. I mean, I mean non-Orthodox students about orthodoxy. And I look back and I, I, I was privileged, I guess, to be one of the pioneers in evangelical theological education by introducing them. So I, I got to teach uh, courses on introduction to orthodoxy in the School of World Mission at Trinity Divinity School. Uh, so this was when the Iron Curtain fell and Western missionaries were flooding into Russia and Eastern Europe. And they, they didn't know anything about orthodoxy, so I gave courses on that to help them understand what the, the cultural and religious context. I also taught courses at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville. My former professor, uh, Tim Weber, was from Denver, now moved to, to, uh, to uh, Louisville. So I did a course there on Byzantine church history and uh, then uh, taught at uh, uh, then Northern Baptist, I do that now, in, um, in Lombard, a course for their seminarians on the early and medieval church history. That's not just Orthodox, that's East and West. And uh, Denver Seminary, a number of years, a few years ago, asked me to do a course on spirituality. So I taught mystical theology of the Eastern Church. I was the director of academic programs for one of the extension sites at Fuller Seminary and also taught courses at Fuller on patristics and orthodox introduction to orthodoxy. Maybe the highlight, or certainly in addition to all that, one of the highlights of my experience was to team teach a course with J.I. Packer at Regent College. Dr. Packer, as Father Chad said, is one of the, uh, one of the premier evangelical theologians. He died, I believe, last year. But Packer wrote, Dr. Packer invited me to teach a course on orthodoxy and evangelicalism in dialogue. And that was a highlight for me because he was absolutely wonderful, brilliant man. And he had me do the talking and then he would respond. And then the students, uh, we had about 30 students from missionaries who were going into Eastern Europe. And uh, he took me out to lunch the first day, I think, or the second day I got there. And in his British way, he said to me as we were sitting across the table, he said, <clears throat> he said, oh, Brad, he said, I thought you'd like to know that if I never became ortho, never became evangelical, that I would join the Eastern Orthodox Church. I wouldn't join the Catholic Church, he said, but I would join the Orthodox Church. And, and I just thought that you'd like to know that. Well, that was surprising to me. I wasn't asking him for it, but that was one of the stories you hear about. You won't hear about J.I. Packer, but I'm telling you about it. I could tell you some more stories about it, but I don't have the time. So um, here we are then. And uh, so you put it all together. What I have had, the writing of this book, The Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church, is the product of uh, many years of experience in both of these traditions. And so it's a byproduct of that. And I want in that book to build a bridge. Now, as I said, this book is not just about that. The first half of the book is just about the Orthodox tradition and how the gospel expresses itself in the liturgy, in the dogma, and in the spirituality of the church. Those are three areas that I explore in part one. Forget the evangelical Protestant side. This is just an in-house analysis of how that operates. And so to give you a sense, part one, I've titled it The Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church. And some of the chapters that I have in there are titled The Beauty of Holiness, Deification in the Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. Number two, The Nature of Scripture and the Task of Exegesis. That's about St. John Chrysostom and the role of the Bible. Then another chapter on Orthodox spirituality, the quest for a transfigured humanity. Uh, then I look at the Philokalia. I published, co-published a book with, with Brock Bingaman on that book with uh, Oxford University, Father uh, Metropolitan Callistos Ware um, wrote the foreword. And then Christ as Savior 
in the fathers of the ecumenical councils. So what I do in that book, in that first part, is I explore these different themes. How does the gospel present itself in that context? Doctrine, worship, and spirituality. And then I conclude with a chapter called Nourishing the Gospel in Orthodox Parishes Today. So the question is, what are the goals for the book? And uh, what, um, what am I doing for that? Well, I dedicate this book to every bishop, priest, deacon, monk, and layperson who strives to keep the gospel clear and central in every life-giving action of the church. So that's who it's dedicated to. And uh, so that's... Uh, uh, what I want to say, and I'm sure that the question will be raised, uh, how, how do you balance this and keep the integrity of both in traditions without making this a hybrid? So what I'd like to say, I want to be very clear on what I've written. And the first thing I want to say is what I have not written. I am not saying that the Orthodox Church is an evangelicalism of the Byzantine rite. I'm not saying that. Neither am I saying that orthodoxy needs something that it doesn't have already. I'm not saying that. What I am doing is really quite simple. I'm focusing on the ABCs of the faith, which I believe are urgently needed, not the XYZs of a sophisticated theology. We already have these gifts of the gospel that are given in the liturgy, dogma, and spiritual life of the church. The church has it already, so I demonstrate that an evangelical gospel vision is embedded already in the entire structure of the church, and that this gospel must be kept clear and central in every life-giving action in order for a local parish to flourish. The stronger the gospel is, the stronger the church will be. The weaker the gospel is, the weaker the church will be. So it's imperative that we have a clear understanding of what the gospel is, and then consciously keep it clear in every life-giving action that we do. I note also that this gospel, even though it is there in the church, it can also be hidden from our people if it is not actively made clear and central. It's necessary that we do this so our local parishes may be so strong. Whenever the gospel is weak, the parish is weak, but whenever the gospel is strong, the parish is strong, and there you will find holy fire. So, I begin the book by asking, what is the gospel, and why is it so important for understanding the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Now, my ordained name as a subdeacon was Gabriel. I took that name. Uh, didn't really think as much about it as I have in subsequent years. But you know what Gabriel means? Gabriel is the bearer of the good news. So I'm bearing good news. I hope I am. Good news of Christ and his kingdom. So I uh, suppose it was inevitable that I would write about that in, in the book, Orthodoxy and the Gospel. Uh, these are actually redundant words because Orthodoxy has always been centered in the Gospel. Orthodoxy is evangelical in its very essence. And as both Father Eric and Father Chad have said, this should be cause for rejoicing and joy. Not morbid. Gabriel said to Mary, I bring you good news of great joy. And that's what I hope this book will bring. So I uh, see the gift, the gospel, as the most important gift that the Orthodox Church can give. It's a treasured gift. Church leaders and scholars in the 21st century have increasingly recognized that Orthodoxy cannot nurture our own adherence by simply offering more liturgies or more try-harder sermons. 
that is what some people have tried to do in order to bring spiritual renewal, uh, but they soon find out that it's simply too weak of an approach. The missionary and cultural challenges facing the church today can only be countered by a robust biblical vision of the gospel. So I try to demonstrate that an evangelical ethos is embedded in the entire structure of the tradition, giving it a remarkable unity and cohesion. Uh, I wrote much of what I said in this book has been uh, revised and edited, but given at professional conferences uh, over the past 15 years or so. But the goal of this book is to nurture in readers a faithful commitment to making the gospel clear and central in local Orthodox communi communities and to, to present it in a way that everybody can understand, both inside and outside the church. So this book hopefully will be useful in adult study groups, catechism classes, catechism classes, or individual chapters can be used as supplemental reading as resources for seekers who wish to know more about the power of the gospel. So to that end, the desired outcomes of the book are to stimulate readers and scholars, I really want to sp speak to them as well, to a much greater recognition of the need to emphasize the gospel as the core message of Orthodox Christianity. It's urgently needed even though there is formally, it is there, our churches will grow stronger when that gospel is consciously recognized as the core of our faith. I also hope that others will explore this, this maximalist vision that our church has as it contrasts and compares with Protestant evangelicalism and the difference that makes to the holy tr life of the Trinity and its mission in the world. So to recap, the first part of the book focuses on the gospel in the Orthodox tradition itself, while the second part brings that tradition, that understanding of the gospel, into dialogue with Protestant evangelical understandings. Now, in part one, when I use the term evangelical, I am not referring to the complex and diverse phenomenon of Protestant evangelicalism though a measure of overlap is inevitable when we discuss the Christian faith. I address Protestant evangelicals explicitly in part two. But um, in a Christian context, the gospel, the term, in an Orthodox context, the term evangelical comes from the Greek word evangelion, meaning good news. It refers to the great saving acts of Christ that are revealed in the Bible, and that good news continues to preserve and pass down in the church today. Father Ted Stylianopoulos, who is an emeritus professor of New Testament at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox Seminary, reinforces the propriety of the term evangelical in a very thorough study he has done on the meaning of the gospel in the New Testament, and that's really the finest I've ever seen. It's called the Apostolic Gospel. It's a little bit, little short book. And he maintains that it's altogether fitting for an Orthodox Christian to use that term evangelical, and that we may rightly speak of the church's evangelical character or evangelical spirit or evangelical ethos. And I have a lengthy quote that I'm not going to read from him, but that's basically what he says. So, well, let me read a little bit. He says, evangelical is a perfectly good word for the quality of life, beliefs, and conduct of early Christians. One can speak of the evangelical ethos of the authors of the New Testament, or the evangelical spirit of early Christians, or the evangelical nature of the early church, or even the evangelical character of the New Testament itself. Any aspect of Christian life and theology with essential connection to the gospel may be called evangelical. It embraces and illuminates the entire faith, end quote. So that's what I mean when I talk about the evangelical character of the Orthodox Church. 
Don't associate it necessarily with Protestant evangelicalism. It's our own word. It's the Bible's word. Don't be afraid to use it. But you will have to be aware that it will, most people will tend to think, especially in America, of the Protestant heritage. So you need to be understanding and ready for that. Another feature of part one of the book is the pastoral character of what I've written. Much of what takes place in the scholarly world today um, often does not easily translate into practical church life. I don't know if you've noticed that, but the academy and the church are often far apart. The different social location of the academy and the local parish contribute to this bifurcation. Although most of my essays were originally published by academic presses or delivered uh, at professional conferences, I've tried to bridge the gap between the church and the academy by writing in a style that I trust will be accessible for the average reader. Some of us theologians, unfortunately, make things more complicated than we need to. Um, and in that score, I'm reminded of a story about Albert Einstein. It seems that Albert Einstein had more trouble finding his way home one day from work than he did understanding the physics of atomic power. The story goes that one evening, Albert Einstein was on the train coming home from Princeton and he misplaced his ticket. When the porter came to collect it, Einstein rummaged through his coat and his pockets and his shirt and everywhere else he could and he began to panic because he couldn't find that ticket. So the porter comes up to him, he says, that's okay, Dr. Einstein, I know you ride this train every day. I can get it tomorrow, don't worry about it. And Einstein replied, well, that's fine for you, young man, but how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to know how to get off the train without my ticket? <laughs> he couldn't figure it out. So theologians can be like Einstein. We sometimes fail to see how simple things can be because we're always making things more complicated than they really need to be. Now, honestly, I do. Re I regard myself as simply an, a, a garden variety theologian. I, uh, you know, I'm not an Albert Einstein. I'm more or less just a tomato in the garden. So I try to avoid things making more complicated than they need to be in this book and keep things both technically accurate, but also easy to understand. So in this last chapter of part one, I've titled it Nourishing the Gospel in Orthodox Parishes Today. And that's really the, the so what of it all, chapter one. If you want to know where after, if, after all is said and done in chapter one, just go to that final chapter and you'll see what it is, uh, how I apply this. Uh, what I want to do there is what I do there is I make it very clear. What then is the gospel? What is it? What's it about? Well, let me summarize it for you in a few paragraphs. And that's a lot to summarize, by the way. The gospel is not simply the proclamation that Jesus died and rose again, and that people need to repent and make a decision to follow Jesus, even though all that is true. The gospel is much more than that. It's a story, the story of God's intention to dwell among his people in the creation he made. The gospel is all about the kingdom of God, which spans from creation to consummation, from the beginning of history to the fulfillment of history in its climax in the new creation. It's about the new people of God through whom God is ushering in this new creation. This world was made to be God's abode, God's home, God's dwelling. But as we know in the book of Genesis, things went wrong in the Garden of Eden. So out of love for his creatures, God begins a rescue plan through Abraham. And eventually it climaxes in the incarnation of God's son, so that through his life, but especially his death and resurrection, creation begins to be renewed. That's the point of the resurrection. It's the start of something new. It's the beginning of the new creation. Dr. Kesich from St. Vladimir's, in fact, wrote a book titled that, 
the first day of the new creation. So all of that, uh, the church, is on the front lines of bringing the good news of the kingdom to bear. And it's borne witness in our liturgies, in our spirituality, and in our dogmatic tradition. So the gospel is about God dwelling with us, renewing his creation here and now in the hearts of those who surrender to his kingdom. And at the end of the story, at the end of human history, God's original purpose for human history is going to be fulfilled through the renewing of the whole creation that will finally be realized in what the book of Revelation calls the new heavens and the new earth. So the whole of liturgy and life is a celebration and anticipation of that new creation. Yes, God has powerfully defeated sin, death, and the devil on the cross. But the whole emphasis of what that is moving forward, moving forward to the new creation, the time when it will be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The transfiguration of human nature and the whole of God's creation dominates the church's vision of the gospel. And that's why the gospel needs to be kept clear and central in every life-giving action of the church. The theology of light, the theology of transformation, the theology of change, that's what our tradition is about. It's about the changing of the heart, not only the heart, but the whole of God's creation. And what I love, what I tried to do here in this book, Read that first chapter, the beauty of holiness, deification in the liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. I hope when you, if you get the book, if you read that first chapter, you'll go to the Divine Liturgy on Sunday morning with a new set of eyes. You'll listen to things you never heard before, but you've heard the words all your life, but listen to what's being said. It's the gospel. It's the good news of the triumph. And some of the verbiage, especially in the Matin service, is powerful. The verbs, Christ has conquished, has conquered death. He has vanquished the power of the devil. Listen to those verbs. Have you heard them before? That's what I try to do. I want to get the, the power of the gospel alive in our hearts, alive in our ears, so that when we go to church on Sunday morning, we're different people after we take communion. So that's the whole idea of the first part. Now, I must move quickly because uh, I'm going to shorten this talk here uh, because I know it's a little hard to listen to long talk and I don't want to wear you out with too much talk. So let me go finally to the, uh, to the second and last part of the book. Uh, Orthodoxy and evangelicalism in dialogue. So what I've done in part one is I've talked about what is the gospel in the church. Now that we have this understanding, let's talk about how that gospel relates to the Protestant evangelical heritage. And as I've said, you have the Protestant, the evangelicalism of the pew, but you also have the evangelicalism of the academy. And most of us are not aware of the academic side. And I have a great respect for the evangelical heritage and I think you probably would too, if you knew what I knew about it. You, you really would respect it, uh, whether it's uh, from a Calvinist or an Arminian view and any honest person, even though we do have serious theological disagreements, especially with Calvinism, uh, you, you have to recognize it. It's not st a stupid, uh, ignorant uh, religion. I mean, there's a logic to it and we must deal with it in, in some way that's constructive. So what I try to do, I ask the question, how does orthodoxy's maximalist understanding of the gospel, how does that, which is what it is, it's a huge, I mean, we take the elements of the gospel, but look what we do with them. It's maximal. The icons, for example, what are they? They're the visual gospel. The icons are a testimony of the incarnation, John 1.14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. You know what that is? That's the gospel. So how do we, so evangelicals will affirm the incarnation, yes, but they disaffirm, you know, how that plays out in the iconography of the church and so many other areas of, 
of life. So what I want to do in that question, in that part, is to bring our tradition into dialogue with the evangelical tradition. Now, here in America, there's about 25% of our population are evangelical. So for us, this is a major missiological fact that we need to deal with and, and be aware of. Now, if you go off, and we're only in what Father Chad said, we're lucky if we're 1% of the population, aren't we? Real small percentage. You go off the United States, though, you go to Russia, Romania. Romania is the second largest uh, Orthodox population in the world. Russia is the largest. So I hope that this book, and it's going to be translated into Russian uh, by a man who's uh, volunteered to do that for the press. So I'm really excited about that. Uh, but this is what, uh, this is the kind of thing that uh, we need to do. So what is evangelicals? What are, what is an evangelical? Well, the term, as I said, means a gospel, but evangelicalism as a historical phenomenon can simply be described as a trans-denominational movement of Christians from various denominations who agree upon a common set of theological principles and who have also had a common experience called the born-again experience. Now, the theological principles of what constitute evangelicalism is itself debated by evangelical historians. The bibliography is huge. When did evangelicalism begin? Was it the 19th century Princetonian movement? Was it in the Reformation? Does it go back to St. Augustine? Can we follow, find evangelicalism in the early church? I'm not going to answer those questions. Evangelicals have discussed this. But what I do in the book is I used a broad definition by David Bebbington, who is a historian in, in England, and he's wrote a book. And he gives four marks of what constitutes an evangelical. Number one, the Bible is the word of God. Number two, the cross is God's instrument of salvation and forgiveness of sins. Number three, conversion is personal. And, uh, no, and, and number four, missions and evangelism. An evangelical is someone who engages strongly in missions and evangelism. And those four distinctives, now we might say as Orthodox, well, what, what's so unique about that? We believe the Bible is the word of God. We believe that the cross is the instrument of salvation. We believe in personal conversion, and we believe in missions and evangelism. The difference is evangelicals, it's the word emphasis. That's what makes them different. These characteristics are a unifying theological vision, whether they're Anglican evangelical, Baptist evangelical, Pentecostal, although that's another question. Are Pentecostals part of the evangelical tradition? They're part of the holiness tradition. Uh, and then uh, Charismatics and uh, Lutheran Evangelicals. So different denominations have within them people who have these four characteristics, and that is a movement. It's decentralized, and uh, but they agree to that. So um, that kind of evangelicalism that I've described is is uh, looks quite different. I mean. Uh, uh, these characteristics are true of evangelicalism across the globe. But here in America, in the last, especially since the last presidential election, uh, evangelicals have split those that are more politically minded and those that want to keep the spiritual emphasis. So today, I've heard even some prominent evangelical historians saying, well, we don't, shouldn't even have the word anymore because it has too much political association rather than the spiritual and theological. So the real problem that we have as Orthodox is to ask the question, will the real evangelical please stand up? How do we know an evangelical? Is it just somebody who has social engagement uh, or are they keeping these distinctives foremost in their mind? Some evangelicals have even taken the movement in the direction of theological liberalism. And that, of course, has raised its own uh, questions. The last thing I would say then uh, is uh, in the second part of the book, 
Well, the first chat one in chapter two, as I said, I deal with orthodoxy and that evangelical tradition. The first chapter I've called evangelicalism through orthodox eyes. If you want my best attempt to do a theological analysis of how our tradition and the evangelical tradition compares, that's my best shot at it. If you have a catechism class and you have Protestant people, evangelicals that want to know more about how the two compare, you might find this chapter helpful. It's not bedtime reading. It is my best uh, theological, I put my theological hat on and did the best that I could with it. I'm sure there were weaknesses and things to improve, but I think it's still basically right in the things I've said. So that might be helpful. Um, but uh, the last chapter, I do a history of, pro of Orthodox evangelical dialogues from the 1990s to the present. I've already told you about the, the, uh, the SSEOE that we did here in America, um, but there have also been efforts undertaken by the World Council of Churches uh, in, I forgot the exact year, I think it was 1997, that the World Council of Churches uh, invited uh, a number of people maybe 50 people from all over the world to assemble in Alexandria, Egypt, under the blessing of the Pope of Alexandria at that time, the Coptic Church. So 50 of us from around the world met under the auspices of the WCC, Orthodox and Evangelicals. That started because of the proselytizing that was going on in Eastern Europe. Then they had other meetings after that, smaller ones in Hamburg, Germany, and these things ended up in books. But uh, <clears throat> so you had the, S the SSEOE started it chronologically, the WCC closely followed it. And I would say that the most important movement today, and one which I never would have expected in my lifetime to see, because I lived through a very cold period of relations between the two, is called the uh, LOI, or the Lausanne Orthodox Initiative. Do I need to wait a second? Okay. Okay. <laughs> this LOI or this Lausanne Orthodox Initiative has been and going on for over uh, since 2013. It's the most spectacular movement of Orthodox and Evangelical conversation partners that I have seen. I never would have guessed that this is would have happened. I guess it's because I lived through so much of the other. Um, but it's an international organization of senior theologians and missiologists. It's by invitation only uh, from both the Orthodox, including the non-Chalcedonian Orthodox and evangelical worlds. About 60 people from all over the world, bishops, priests, church leaders, as well as evangelical missiologists from Oxford uh, have all been a part of this and other places. The goal of the LOI is to reflect, quote, to reflect constructively on the history of relationships between Orthodox and Evangelicals in order to work towards a better understanding, encourage reconciliation, and healing where wounds exist. Now, you can learn more about it if you go to loimission.net, loimission.net. Now, the group was started by the Coptic Orthodox Bishop, uh, Archbishop, His Grace Angelos from London. He, so it started with an Orthodox Bishop. And on the evangelical side, Miss Leslie Dahl. Some of the key leaders in the movement are doc, have been Dr. Mark Oxbro from the Oxford Mission Center and the current facilitator, Dr. Tim Gross from, uh, from England, uh, who's a very fine historian and senior research scholar uh, over there. These are all first-class first, first class scholars in their own right, and I've mentioned Jim Stimoulis and his fine work as well. I cannot speak highly enough of all the LOI is accomplishing. Our first meeting was held in Albania in 2013 under Archbishop Anastasios Yanulatos and the blessing of the uh, Ecumenical Patriarch, and I had the blessing also of Archbishop Philip Saliba when he was alive. Um, bishops, theologians, and churchmen from Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Romania, Greece, uh, people all met 
senior scholars. We met in Holy Cross a few years ago, and I'm not sure where the next meeting is going to be. But it continues this day, and it's really a very fine group. Okay, so in conclusion, uh, my book will be available for any of you who are interested in reading it or can, would like to know more about what the subject is, is. I should tell you that all the proceeds will go to St. Vladimir Seminary. I will not be making a penny off of this book. I have dedicated all my whatever proceeds go to the mission of St. Vladimir's. And uh, Father Chad and the faculty are doing an incredible job there. So I hope that you will support the seminary through the purchase of this book and other books as well. They are certainly at the forefront of Orthodoxy's witness in America and around the globe. So I thank you for this opportunity to share in your ministry and the opportunity to share what God has given me to do. We are remarkably almost on time, uh, but before we have lunch, and I know people are very anxious to have their lunch, I, I want three priests to say, Father Remus, before you go into the kitchen, we want to again acknowledge you, Father Peter, and your work, Father Matthew. There you are. If you'll stand, we want to thank you for the way you've led your parishes and things that are here. They do. So we remember the women of the Ladies Auxiliary of this beautiful cathedral and Aaron Susick and Maka Tyler. Thank you again for all the things you did to help us put this together for the day. An old friend, Father Alexander, if you'll stand again, thank you for the work that you've done in promoting this event today, Father Alexander. So just like you see on uh, uh, PBS, I want to remind you, supporting the seminary today, $100 level is the tumbler. The $250 level is a copy of the Evangelical Theology of the Orthodox Church, Dr. Nassif's book. $500 level is, is the complete Orthodox Profile Series, which is a series I'm privileged to edit. $1,000 level, Volume 1 and Volume 2 of A Voice for Our Time, the translation of Father Alexander Schmemann's broadcast into the former Soviet Union. So all of that is available for you. We're going to take a lunch break. Some of you are going to do your support for the seminary and the future clergy. So if you'll stand, we'll offer a prayer. The poor will eat and be filled, and those who seek the Lord will praise him. Their hearts will live forevermore. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ our God, extend thy right hand a blessing upon the food of which we are about to partake, the hands that have prepared it, those we love and pray for, and who are absent from us this day. Multiply it for the poor, for you alone are holy always, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Amen.
Here in Cleveland, uh, the am I on? 
May I have your attention for a moment? I hope you are enjoying your lunch. And I would like to add a little cultural, I'd like to add a little bit of cultural dessert to your lunch. The Greater uh, Cleveland Russian Chorus, conducted by Michael Pilot, will entertain us and will lift up our hearts with uh, some of their renditions. Please pay attention. Thank you. Can you put right there? Oh, no, no, it sounds terrible. Holy Prince Vladimir, you were like a merchant in search of fine pearls, sending servants to Constantinople for the Orthodox faith. You were priced on priceless pearls. He appointed you to be another Paul, washing away in baptism your physical and spiritual blindness. We celebrate your memory, asking you to pray for all Orthodox Christians. And for us, your spiritual children. Good afternoon. We are the Greater Cleveland Russian Chorus. Um, and we have a little program on your table. I hope you can follow. We're going to sing a few uh, selections in a uh, church Slavonic. Uh, but the translations are there. We sing for you now. Bosklignite, mm -hmm. Gospoda. Bosklignite, Gospoda, Bisya, Zemya. Bos klik mi te gospode vi sja zemlja. Bojte, bojte že imete, bojte že imete djevo. Nadite slavu, slavu vole djevo. Pobednites ja čudesa jemu, kto vam vezi, jako bol naš ti jesi odvornja. Tvoje zeleniju, Bože stiša nebe sad, Bože stiša slavu tvoja, I bišam se ljudje, Stiša ljudje, Pravdu, Let's go see 
sing it or to leave it out? Sing it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Сыне, благослови Тебя, Господа, си раби Господни, стоящи и раме Господни, во Творе Дому Бога нашего, во Творе Боже, руки ваша восхвалая, и благословите Господа, благословите Господа сила, сотвори. Our next selection, Neimami, is a creation of Boris Ledkovsky. Boris Ledkovsky was a native of Russia and a graduate of the Moscow Conservatory, but he migrated to America in the early 1950s and soon became a professor of liturgical music at St. Vladimir's Seminary. His church compositions became known for their special harmonizations based upon modal tonalities and melodies deriving from ancient Slavic chants. It was my good fortune to study under Professor Witkowski back in the uh, mid 1960s. Uh, we now offer this hymn, We Have No Other Hope Than You, O Theotokos, uh, composed by Professor Witkowski. Um, and especially now that we have just celebrated the protection of the Virgin uh, a day ago. <clears throat> Oh, 
constraints we're going to omit the next uh, selection but and go on to a couple of folk songs uh razboynikov the 12 robbers is among uh, russian folklore stemming from the 1800s the most popular version of the story is about a band of robbers and their fierce leader it has it that their leader kudayar was indeed a nephew of Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, Tsar of Russia in the 16th century. Here now is our own Kudayar, Ken Kovac, a graduate of St. Vladimir's Seminary in the 1969, uh, to relate the story to you. Господи Богу помолимся, Дверью милого свести, Так солокам рам раскал, и ног честной пити. Жило двенадцать разбойников, Жило там манкудиар, Много разбойники провели, Крови честни крестиар. Дребную пиво свести, так солокам нам расколол зевал и ног честной пить и днем с 
Подуповнице тешилася, Ночью над веки творит. Друг у разбойника лютого Совесть Господь Дредли Бросил на беги твори, сам куди яр монастир пошел, Богу и людям служить. Господа Богу помолимся. Так сало, как нам Рота, 
Thank you. Our next selection is an adaptation from the gospel, the second Sunday before Christmas. Uh, and as you will hear in the, our final verse of this song, uh, if we're slow in responding to God's invitation, he may leave us behind. <clears throat> I cannot call, I cannot come, I cannot come, I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble me now, I have married a wife, I have bought me a cow, I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum, pray hold me excuse, I cannot come. A certain man held a feast on his fine estate in town. He laid a festive table and wore a wedding gown. He sent an invitation to his neighbors far and wide. But when the meal was ready, each one of them replied, I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have brought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me, excuse, I cannot come. The master rose up in anger, called his servants by name, said, Go into the town, steal the pledge and the lane, and the fields and the pauper, for this I have me will. My banquet will be crowded and my table must be filled. I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble me now. I have married a wife, I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me, excuse, I cannot come. When the poor had assembled, there was still room to spare. So the master demanded both servers everywhere to the highways and the pots. I ways and force them to come in. My table must be filled before my banquet can begin. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't trouble me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me, excuse, I cannot go. Now God has written a lesson for the rest of mankind. If we're slow in responding, he may leave us behind. He's preparing the banquet for that great and glorious when, when the Lord and Master fails us, he certain that, that you say, oh yes, I'll, I'll come to the banquet. No trouble for me now. I will bring my pretty wife and some milk from the cow. I have fields and commitments that cost him wait till noon. Great London, me committed. I will come. Join with us on our last selection. Mm -hmm. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of rain, for purple mountains, majesty above the America, America, 
God shed his grace on thee and crown thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea. O oh, beautiful for patriots dream that sees beyond the years thy alabaster cities gleam until my human tears America America God shed his grace on thee and from thy good with brotherhood from sea to shining sea America America my
Brad, you might say how many years Christians and Muslims live peacefully together. You ready now? Okay, great. We've got a lot of questions. Some of them have, have come from the, the people who are physically here with us today. Uh, we have some that have been uh, submitted from those who are with us virtually. Uh, I'm going to take the first one, which is, is there any thought to establishing a distance learning component at the seminary? Okay. Well, we're speaking about St. Vladimir's in particular. The answer is yes. Um, we've been working closely with Orthodox Christian Leadership Initiative uh, over the last five years, and I'm very pleased to announce that in the autumn, the plan is finally, you know, in Orthodoxy, the fast track is 400 years. So when you can accomplish something in five, that's a pretty good thing. Uh, we'll be launching the first fully hybrid MA, uh, God willing, in the fall. It'll have a, um, an emphasis upon servant leadership, the doulo side of leadership. Uh, we already have the Doctor of Ministry program, which is a hybrid online. We're building, rebuilding the faculty in a way which will make it easier for us to handle uh, um, a distance learning component in a, in a way that won't absolutely overrun everything. Uh, you can imagine if, if you're a professor and suddenly online, you've got a class of 250, and that's not impossible. We're looking at our own infrastructure, other such things, you know, to, to help us to get there. So the answer is yes, we're getting there in bits and pieces. Um, one of the other things that uh, Dr. Alex Tudoria, our academic dean, is working very diligently on is the possibility of bringing the PhD degree to St. Vladimir's, and that is possible again within the next couple of years. So the answer is yes. I'll conclude this by saying, as far as St. Vladimir's goes, I know the same is true at St. Ticon's. Uh, as far as the ordination track, the MDiv degree, it is to be residential period. The online of training future priests in front of a screen. Uh, I don't know of anyone in the administration of the faculty at either seminary who are keen about such things. So yes, yes, and yes, and maybe. <laughs> Eric. Yep. I'll take <clears throat> this next question. Why don't we do a better job of welcoming people into the church, especially if you are of a different ethnic background? That's a loaded question because um, it's not necessarily always something that can be taught. I mean, you can talk about it, but it has to be something that's lived out. And so the church is not there for just one person or one group or whatever. The church is there for the whole world. So a great example is uh, when the first Alaskan missionaries came in 1793 to Kodiak, and they were sent there to take care of the Russian uh, trading company, the Russians there, they immediately said that that was not going to be their mission, that they were going to go out and bring the gospel to the whole world. We have to think like that. The priest can't walk outside the church and just say, well, there's no one here anymore. I did that to a young priest once. He said, well, there's no one here anymore. And I brought him to the front door of the church. He said, there's a whole world right here. Your whole community is your parish. They haven't realized it yet, but that's the way you need to treat it. So that's if you start thinking in those terms, then it becomes very different. When I was a priest in Las Vegas, we had... 15 different languages being spoken in that church, probably on an average Sunday. And I'd say a third of my parish was African. And on Pascha, we'd have about a thousand people in church. And you just, you grab anybody and everybody. So really what you have to decide as a parish is what is it that you're going to be? If you're going to decide that you're going to be to this group or to that group, then that's where you will stay. But if you decide that the whole world is your parish, your whole community is your parish, then you need to learn what that means and, and utilize that gift of hospitality. So everybody is our parish. I have a question here. It can be answered 
pretty easily or pretty quickly, speak to the influx of 1 million Syrians in recent years into Lebanon. How has this influenced orthodoxy in Lebanon? Uh, the reason for that, as we know, is from Islamic persecution and Christians fleeing. I know the Patriarch of Antioch has left Damascus and is now in or near Beirut. So you do have that reality. It obviously weakens the witness in Syria, and um, which is a tragic thing. But what else can you do? The Christians are leaving the Middle East in large numbers. The historic presence of Christians in the Holy Land, even in the surrounding territories, is quickly dwindling. So we're seeing historically um, a, a significant uh, shift in Christian population. It's a tragic thing, but uh, that's the reality. Okay, I'll take one from this end, I guess. This question is, how might the building of the Greek Orthodox Church in New York on the site of 9-11 Ground Zero help in the evangelization of US Orthodoxy? Uh, well, that's been a long process. It's a lot of news back and forth about uh, the construction of St. Nicholas at Ground Zero. I guess uh, to answer the question, I would say certainly it's going to be in a unique place uh, and it raises the Orthodox flag to an awful lot of people who are going to be in that area. So hopefully that building will be used as a way of introducing people not only to Hellenism, but to Orthodoxy in its broad perspective here in America. So I have one here. What about having an app for the OCA? So he gives an example. So young people would love it. Um, I know my colleague, former colleague at the Chancery, Father Alex Garcloves, and I worked on redoing the website there. I'm no longer at the Chancery, but with, that was part of the plan. There is actually an app. And I know in my parish itself, I have someone developing an app. Here's, here's a, a, a thought. St. Nikolai of Zicha said, and this was, now think about this, this was back in turn of the century, so, make your theology ultra-conservative, but your communication ultra-modern. Now, he was talking about English and all that, but I think that's what we have to think about. How can we reach people through all these wonderful gifts? They're two-sided sword, you know? I mean, I know when we started live streaming everything, we gained a huge amount of audience, but I also know that there were people who probably were happy sitting and watching the TV show at home, you know, so you have to always take the good with the bad, but they are tools to be used. And I think we need every tool that we can use to get the message out. We use it. How's that? What would you say to someone who... checked out um the claim that no one can know the true religion or there's no way to know the true religion i think is uh, is um i disagree with that premise it expresses religious relativism which says that basically there's no right and there's no wrong and your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth even if they differ we'll just agree to that we differ and not really try to seek out any truth I think as an Orthodox Christian, we would have to say uh, that there is truth and it can be known intellectually, but uh, especially experientially. Truth is not just something in the head, but something in the heart. And uh, how do you know that an experience is truly from God and not simply a psychological experience or an emotional one? The only way you can really tell is to test that experience against the criteria of the Bible and the church's tradition itself. That's what keeps, uh, that, that's what St. Gregory Palamas basically did in the 14th century. So truth is known both intellectually and experientially, but you know the truth of your, you can tell the truthfulness of your experience by measuring it against the norms of scripture. Now this doesn't mean, you know, it raises all kinds of questions because um, how do you know which way? And there are different ways of doing apologetics 
which is what this is. And um, one way, and I'm not saying this is the only way, is to um, take an approach which says, take the amount of evidence and, and weigh it out, and you accept that conclusion, which is most consistent with reason and the data as you know it. That's a more rational approach. Uh, then you have uh, different systems of apologetics. I don't think I should go into that, but essentially the answer is there is truth. It can be known experientially, and that experience can be tested by the truth claims of Christianity in dialogue with uh, the culture and the sciences that we have. Question is, uh, what visions for education and orthodoxy prevail, homeschool or public school format? Um, I think this question is, is sort of answered in part of what I said, that there is this movement within orthodoxy, the Constantine movement, St. Constantine. Uh, again, maybe the most vocal and articulate proponent for this is uh, Dr. John Mark Reynolds. Uh, the St. Constantine School, which is a pan-Orthodox school that was founded in Houston, Texas, is K through 16. So when I first saw that, of course, of course I knew how that, what that meant, but it's like, how does that work? Um, so they have their, their college program, their undergraduate program that is accredited by another institution um, that allows their college program to be accredited. I know they would eventually like that to be with an Orthodox institution. Um, and we don't have that pathway uh, for them as of yet. But it is, as I said in my presentation, there are a lot of parishes are, are refounding parochial schools. There's quite a movement for these classical schools uh, and people are changing their minds. Um, uh, my youngest son was very much opposed to this idea of homeschooling and, and these academies and things. Uh, he's changed his mind. He's now on the school board for an Orthodox Academy uh, in Wichita. So there's a demand for it. Um, what we can do to sort of supplement other things, for instance, OCF and, and what we're trying to do on college campuses, that's a very open question. I, I, I said again in my presentation, I don't think we're doing it adequately. I don't think we're rising to the occasion at all. So there's just a lot of work to do, but this is something to monitor. It shows that there's an interest and we're seeing this happening. My last thing on that is the St. Constantine School is franchising. I know it sounds like it's McDonald's or something. And there are, I think, five or six communities that I personally know of that are actually in that process of founding those schools. You all still with us? Okay. Making the transition from a non-denominational Christian to one of the Orthodox faith is somewhat scary. Can you speak on that? It's supposed to be scary. <laughs> and it is because it, it, it is totally out of, for some people, totally out of their comfort zone. And uh, I, I find that the people who walk into the Orthodox Church for the first time have a lot of courage. A lot of courage to be able to do that because you're leaving a lot of assumptions behind and you're going on a journey that's going to take you in a place that you probably don't realize at this point. But think about the gospel reading we had last week. Right, the miraculous catch of fish. And what was the reaction when Peter saw Christ? He was afraid. And then what ended up happening? He became catchers of men, not fishers of men, catchers of men. So it is scary and it is different and it is, and we are strange and that's okay because um, it leads us to something, some place that we would never think that we would be. So don't be afraid. And Christ say that a few times. Do not be afraid. Um, I'll answer this question uh, very quickly. Speaking to Orthodox Christian youth, I find a counterattack by Protestant people, 14 to 25 years old. Christian Orthodoxy, this question says, Christian Orthodoxy is an extension of Zoroastrianism. And your opinion and youth should respond. Okay, well, what I can make of this question, it sounds like this person thinks is people that are saying that Christianity orthodoxy is simply Zoroastrianism. That's an Iranian religion. It goes way back in the early centuries. Um, my only answer is that this 
person needs to study history and theology because they're confusing the two. Well, this is this is a very interesting question. I think, and maybe all three of us may want to respond. Uh, the question is: Should we not uh, renew across the church the ancient and venerable? Uh, process of the catechumenate with its several stages, um, having its own distinct aim in helping the catechumens more spiritually towards reception of baptism or chrismation. How would that process with its stages? Um, how, would that, how would that look? I actually taught a course last fall at the seminary that was just simply examining what the church expected of converts in the first five centuries. Uh, everything from the Didache and, and early church writings. Uh, it was fascinating for the class, and then the class had to apply that to the contemporary scene. Uh, but across the church, we're seeing um, the restoration of the catechumenate. Uh, I, I was actually uh, Father John Parker, the Dean of St. Tikhon Seminary. I was the first reader for his Doctor of Ministry uh, project and thesis. And he did intensive work on the catechumenate. And one of the things that he discovered, not so shockingly, is because in orthodoxy, nobody has the baton and is directing the symphony, we're, we're a cacophony of chaos out there. Everybody is doing everything in terms of the catechumenate. Some are remarkably strict, like a two-year program. And if you miss one session, you have to start over. Uh, and some are, as Father Eric said for his father, oh, here, read this book. I'm going to oil you up next Saturday, you know, and all will be well. Wide, wide, wide spectrum. So the answer to this question is yes, it would be terrific if we had the ability in the U.S. to actually coordinate ourselves to be cross-jurisdictional. We don't have that ability. So that means our bishops in particular need to take the lead on this. Most likely, you're not going to see much of that, so it's going to be parish priests, like what you heard from Father Eric and some others. That's my opinion. It's time for it. Liturgically, a lot of parishes that drop the prayers for the catechumenate are restoring them because simply we have catechumens. I'm, I'm, a, I'm when it's not COVID, I'm on the road a lot. I see a lot of different liturgical practices. And one that I, I like is, is, is when actually the catechumens come forward in the churches when the litany for the catechumenate is being prayed over them. It's a very nice custom I see in not many, but some parishes. And I think we're seeing that restoration of the catechumenate. Um, as I always tell the young priests, if you don't pray for catechumens, God's not going to send you any. <laughs> so you, you need to do that prayer. And um, a lot, like my practice is after a person has been coming to the catechism classes for a while, there's a point where you just look at him and say, now is the official time for you to be enrolled as a catechumen because we know where this direction is going. And uh, so a lot of parishes are already doing that. They're restoring that catechumenate and making a big fuss about it too, which I think it needs to be done. And uh, so, yeah, the answer is yes, it's being, it's being done individually. <laughs> And I would just finally add that it's important for us not to take a one size fits all approach to yep. catechumenate. Mm -hmm. Every person is unique and made in the image of God. They all have their own stories. And so we uh, should take them one at a time. So it's back to me. Yeah. Okay. So here's the question Are we do, are we, to bring other Christians into Orthodoxy, Protestant, Eastern Catholic, Roman Catholic, or just the nuns and duns, you know, like we talked about, N-O-N-E-S. We always have to say that to make sure. I think that's pretty obvious. We bring everybody, <laughs> whoever's there, uh, you just reach out. And everyone has, as, as Bradley said, everyone has a different story. And, um, and we go in waves, too. I mean, there was a point I know with Father Chad came in, you know, it was that wave of, of Episcopalians that were coming into the church. After Vatican II, we had the wave of Roman Catholics coming into the church. Um, we had that wave in the, in the 90s, eight, late 80s, early 90s, of evangelicals coming into the church. We're going to have those different waves. We can't plot it. We just throw out the net. And whoever we catch, we catch. So, uh, but I think the one that is probably... We, 
and I know all the different denominations are talking about it. You know, what do we do with the nuns and the duns? And what do we do with the, the youth, retaining youth? I think those are the three things. My opinion, we're in a pagan society again, so let's just treat it as if we're in a pagan society and start re-Christianizing everybody. Yeah. So, um, but I can't, you can't project it. You just do it. Since 400 AD, Christianity has violently fought Islam. Number one, Arabs. Number two, Ottoman. Number three, ISIS. Yet both USA Trump and Biden administration yield to Islam universal empire builders. Please comment. Uh, this is a political question, the way it's put, so I'm not going to have a great deal to say. There's some historical inaccuracy saying since 400 AD, Christianity has fought Islam. Islam didn't come until 600, so there's a 200-year era there. Um, but that's okay. It's, you understand. Um, it's true that Muslims and Christians have been historically at odds. John of Damascus certainly had his uh, statements to make about the Muslims. And then orthodoxy under Islam from 1453, the Ottoman Empire has been very difficult. That's worth a whole lecture on orthodoxy under the Muslims. I will say, however, that um, in Lebanon and, and the people I've known in the 1970s, Christians and Muslims and Jews got along there for a while. I remember growing up, mom and, and the families saying, you know, why is there so much trouble over there? We get, we get along fine. But that was a short period of time. It's important that Orthodox Christians and all Christians still give Muslims the good news. We shouldn't just say, well, you've got your religion, I've got mine. There's a way of doing it tactfully, lovingly, um, but it really, you're not helping a person if you say, no, if you never really want to share Christ. The world is better with Christ than without him, and that includes Islam. I think I can put uh, more or less three of these together and repackage it a bit. <clears throat> the question is about those for whom figures like the ones I've mentioned, Jordan Peterson, uh, Rod Dreher, um, and this person calls them the New Zealots. Um, you know, how is it that we, we, you know, we receive them, you interact with them, uh, give them encouragement, what was you know what is about their journey to orthodoxy uh that they find orthodoxy so appealing uh, to be honest as i said in my presentation i don't have a handle on this yet i'm still speaking to a lot of people um i, I don't think again as, as as dr bradley said i don't think there's a one size fits all with all of this i think we just have to acknowledge there is a tremendous amount of, of unrest and happiness when you look at the other kinds of figures, I know I just doused you all with all kinds of, of stats, but COVID has revealed the, the huge, huge percentage of people suffering from depression, loneliness, isolation. We talk about the wonders of communication in our day, what technology has given us. Um, I, we don't know how to interact anymore. Um, there are, there are, there are terms that sometimes as, as a priest hearing confession, you know, I have to call my kids and say, what is this? You know, <laughs> they explain to me. Uh, things are just changing so incredibly rapid. I'll, I'll give you an example uh, very quickly. I don't mean to be, you know, again, provocative or out there, but, but I did not know what a Chad was, okay? So it's my name. Um, and I know about chads, dimple chads, and hanging chads in the 2000 election in Florida, but I didn't know that chads are frustrated heterosexual males that uh, are kind of living off the internet because they don't know how to interact well with another human being, particularly of the opposite sex. How that name Chad got attached to that, I don't know. <laughs> but, I heard that. Yeah, so, so I had to ask. Well, that's just how quickly things are changing. So I would just caution people to be to be a little sensitive, recognize many of these people are knocking on our door almost with like the bruises of, of abused children. They've been through it. They've been through a lot of trauma and they're hearing these voices on the internet and they, they want something. And particularly he's not mentioned here, but, but Jonathan Peugeot, this thing that I mentioned about beauty, um, we Orthodox should be right on top of all of that. 
Anyway, I don't know if either one of you want to respond any more to that one, but that's one. I come from an evangelical background, Chris made in 2014. However, I was disappointed and hurt by the church. My priest never reached out to me during the pandemic, and I'm now wondering, should I go back to become Anglican? As I kind of reminded my parishioners, this is my first pandemic too. And I'm trying to figure it out as all of us are. And, you know, some priests I think did amazing work during the pandemic and some got paralyzed by it. And I think, as I remind, I was telling Dr. Nassif, the last thing I tell my, my uh, catechumens before their chrismate the night before I said, remember this, the church is perfect, but the people in it are not. We are full of sinners. That's why we have a church. So remember, the church is always there and it's always going to be perfect. I can't comment on what a priest does or doesn't do. I'm responsible for my priesthood. And uh, I try to teach responsible priesthood in the classes that I teach at seminary. Um, but remember, it's our first pandemic. We're all trying to figure it out. So be kind and forgiving. And the phone works two ways. You know, I don't know of a priest in this country who wouldn't pick up a phone from someone who called them and said they wanted to talk to them. So you may have a whole bunch. You got more? I just have two more. Yeah. Take them both, I think. Both of them. Okay. Here the question is, is the orthodox understanding of the Theotokos an obstacle to dialogue, in dialogue with Protestant evangelicals, Theotokos? I would answer no, it, it, it doesn't need to be an obstacle in dialoguing with evangelicals if you put it all in its proper Christological context. Theotokos as a term, a Greek term, means the God-bearer. And what that term meant historically in the context of the Christological debates in the fourth and fifth century was that Mary, the subject of Mary's birth, the subject of her birth giving, the one whom she bore, was the logos to theou, the word of God, the son of God, became incarnate in her. And the, the person she bore was the second person of the Trinity. That's what Theotokos is doing. So it really says more about Christ than it does about Mary. Now the question, so that I think should be pretty accessible and most, all Protestants should, evangelicals should, should applaud that because they believe if they're good evangelicals, they believe that Jesus is the son of God. So the Theotokos is a way of affirming a belief that they are an important belief that they have. The problems come with other titles for Mary, all ever virgin, all holy, uh, more honorable than the cherubim, more you know, than the seraphim. Now those titles, Father John Meyendorf, I go back to him for everything. So it's your fault, you know, you have to blame, no. <laughs> Father Meyendorf, in his book, Byzantine Theology, made the statement that he believes, and I heard him say it also in classes, that the term Theotokos is the only dogmatic, truly dogmatic statement the church has made. That doesn't mean the other titles are unimportant, but dogma is, is significant. It means, you know, salvation here. So the other titles, I would, I would relegate for, to an evangelical or somebody who is not familiar with Mary, Put that in its proper context, which is the life of the church. Once a person, if a, it shouldn't, if a person can come into the faith, understanding Mary is the Theotokos, but has questions about these other titles, I would say go slow with them and let them see as a family in the life of the liturgy of the church how this all works. And sometimes it takes years for people to get it. So uh, I don't think it's necessary to put it as an obstacle. Um, go slow. Also note that Orthodox theologians themselves have debated some of this stuff. Uh, and so is it dogma or not dogma, some of these other titles? Well, just know that different people have had said different things, although strong arguments can be made um, in support of these other titles. The last question I have, how is it possible to convey the beauty of the old theological tradition to an individual, individualized and secular society in adolescence and adolescence? How can the old traditional pedagogy be applied to the new pedagogy? Um, 
My answer is keep first things first. That's what I'm trying to say in my book. Keep the main thing, the main thing. And what is the main thing? Jesus Christ and the gospel. So the first place I would start is uh, the question of discipleship. Do you know who Jesus is and what he asks of you? Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny, him, deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake and the gospel and the gospel, the same will save it. What did Jesus say at the beginning of his ministry? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the starting point isn't really communicating old beauty and tradition to an individualized success secular society. What I'm telling you is the gospel, what I, what I see in the New Testament that, and no matter what culture you're in, we all start at the same beginning. We all start with knowing who Jesus Christ is and our need for repentance and personal faith in him. Now, if you just get the cart before the horse and you just talking about, start talking about tradition and things old and new and all the beauty, all that is there, but you, you still haven't laid the foundation. And so I would, I would begin by putting an adolescent, making sure, and this is really critical for adolescents because they're asking the big questions. You know that. And uh, they're important questions. So make sure as best you can that that adolescent understands Christ's command, who he is, what he commands, but also if possible, put that young adolescent in the context of a good solid peer, peers that are gonna reinforce Christian principles. The authority of the parent will wane in those years. So if you're wise, if you can put the child in the context of other Christian people, young kids their age who genuinely love and know Christ, now, when I was growing up with my daughter, we only have one daughter, uh, Melanie, we were very careful to put her, and we did this consciously. We were fully Orthodox. We're going to Holy Transfiguration Antiochian Church, but we put her in an evangelical school. Uh, there weren't good, uh, we looked at other alternatives, and we felt that was the best place for her. Why? Because at least they understood that. And the kids at least, and there's no guarantee, by the way, that evangelical schools are going to give you a good you know, you don't have problems. You have a lot of same problems you have in the public. But by putting them in a context where the gospel is clear and is known and is taught, she had to explain her own orthodoxy to non-orthodox people. And that made her own her own her faith and made her more consciously orthodox in the process. So those are my answers. Jesus Christ first, personal faith and repentance, put him in a good context and uh, protect them, uh, not protect them, but give them a good peer. Uh, put them in, a, control the peer environment as much as you can with other Christians. My last question. You say we need to get modern, which I agree. Please give some ex specific examples of how to get modern. So I remember... <laughs> when we were we were working in the church in las vegas and we i i had this particular gentleman who would just kind of keep coming up to me like we got to get with it father we got to get with the modern times and i said well what do you mean by that well you know uh we gotta we gotta have pews or we gotta have this or we gotta have that and it was all very superficial and the reality is that we need to use the gifts that and tools that god gives us but our theology is unchanging i remember when it was uh the big thing was to get uh, a page in the, uh, an advertisement in the yellow pages right that was going to bring all the people into the church well we know that's worthless now right so now you need a website for example you need a good website and you need a website that is updated there's nothing worse than going a website and the pictures are there from five years ago you need to have that and it needs to be very clear and it needs to draw people to there. Um, you know, you, you need to have, you know, social media again is a double-edged sword, but you need to have some presence on social media, but don't become what like the new priests now, some are their, their social media ministry. They're spending so much time tweeting and doing this other stuff and they're not going to visit the people in the hospital. You know, so I mean, some of the stuff is, basic priestcraft. 
But the tools are there. I mean, um, but the theology is unchanging. You know, I'd rather debate about whether we um, should live stream a liturgy or not than whether Jesus Christ is the son of God or not. So, you know, you're, you got to have teenagers, you got to have young people, you've got to be, they'll tell you where to go, but don't let it be your obsession. There are, and so when I speak about things like being modern, it's how you're communicating the church. You know, emails is a great gift, right? But even now emails are becoming kind of passe. So uh, just kind of understand what, what it is and, and what you're trying to do. I was informed by my kids that because I'm on Facebook, that means I'm an old person because only old people go on Facebook now. So oh, wow. I, I didn't even know. Did you know that? Yes, I was told the same thing. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So anyway, so modern doesn't mean change. Modern means being with it, shall we say, understanding what's out there in the tools. And they are tools. They are not the ends in themselves. That's all I'll say. Hey, well, first of all, thank you all for your patience and thank you for the good questions. Um, I have one more here. I'm gonna kind of condense some of the, the bullet points that are here. Um, I think what's being asked is, is, is two things. Uh, one of them is, uh, at, at, and again, I speak for St. Vladimir, so, um, are, are the, the sort of hot button issues of the day regarding especially human sexuality and abortion and whatever else there. Um, the divorce rate that's now above 50% in American society, these kinds of things, are those being addressed? Yes, they're being addressed in a variety of ways. Um, one of them is the addition of new faculty. We actually have two faculty who have an expertise in bioethics, uh, Anna Iltis and, and Matthew Vest. Why is that important? Well, again, because we've demonstrated things are changing so rapidly. And if I did a survey and, and asked you, uh, what's the Orthodox Church's position on hydration for a person who's having life support pulled from mm -hmm. them? You all know? Yeah, well, you know, it's pretty bad when you've got an Orthodox priest standing there with a family and hospital staff, social workers and whatever else, medical people. And the question is put to the priest, uh, what's the position of your church on hydration? Because the 16 year old has been in the car accident that's gonna have life support pulled off. Uh, the, 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 that's, a, that's a tough modern day kind of question. The answer is yes, we believe the person must remain in hydration. But if the priest just looks totally baffled, that's not good and that's not pastoral care. So uh, His Eminence Archbishop Michael and I have, have had this conversation on more than one occasion. We have three years for the Master of Divinity degree and there is so much that's impending upon us, it's pretty tough to get it all in in three years. So we're constantly shifting how we do things uh, we now require uh, at least one quarter of clinical pastoral education to cover some of those things. But everything I've said so far is about the sort of technological, modern things that people are dealing with. I think more importantly than that, because they're asking, you know, if, I'm, if we're training tough priests, and I would like to say, I, I hope we're training people with great pastoral sensitivity. Um, there are so many people who have been you know, burned and abused uh, from what I, I call spiritual abuse. Um, and as I've said, people are at very different places. St. Paul teaches us very clearly, we have to take people where we find them. Uh, so, another one? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So the answer to that question is yes, I think like, like other seminaries, we're struggling to balance good solid academia so they are so our graduates are good apologists for the faith uh and how do we blend that into a real kind of pastoral formation the last thing i'd say on that is is we have put an, again enough to hire a full-time person who's only doing spiritual formation because we're participating in a program that's being funded by the templeton foundation they chose 15 seminaries ours is one and they're concerned about clergy scandal. 
And so Templeton sunk millions of dollars into this program to track it over several years to see if sincere spiritual formation, and let's face it, a Baptist spiritual formation is different than an Orthodox spiritual formation, but they want to know, does that have an impact on that priest's character? Does that, that drop the, the percentage of clergy scandals that we're dealing with? So that's one way to answer that one. I guess I got another one here, which is, uh, I participated in the past with uh, SVS's Summer Institute. Uh, our plan still on for this seminary to host the next Summer Institute at the seminary campus. Uh, oh, this past June, right, okay. Uh, the, the answer is yes. Again, it's part of, of, of what we do with the Sacred Arts Institute. And as I said at the beginning of this conference, we've learned a lot from COVID. And so we had more people participating virtually today than we actually had here. Although we love it that you were here and you all got a great lunch, right? <laughs> so there are those advantages, but the answer is yes. And hopefully we'll just get better at it. You all have been so patient. Um, you can check the grades when you go out, but uh, at least everybody got a P for participation. So <laughs> can I make you a, should feel very good. A suggestion from the question you had there. From, yeah. just, um, the question about the LGBT community, I've dealt with this significantly. It wasn't something I was looking after, but the context that I was in required me to deal with this. And if anybody wants a short answer and a substantive answer, uh, you can email me or simply go online and look up the title Sexual Paradigms in the Orthodox Church by Bradley Nassif, and you will find a six-page summary of biblical and theological reasons for the way uh, we may, for our sexual views on human sexuality. Sexual Paradigms in the Orthodox Church. Put the mic. Yeah. I feel like Jimmy Swagger. We got it right here. We all became televangelists. We all became televangelists. <laughs> See how we hold the microphone? Yeah, that's great. Again, my personal thanks to you, the thanks from the entire seminary community for your support today, uh, these wonderful parishes. Uh, thanks for your support over decades and decades here. Uh, really good questions. My thanks again for the host parish here. Everybody who stepped up as sponsors, everybody who's donated, there's still those yellow cards. You can take them home, pass them out to friends and family, tell them what a great event you participated in today, and they should do their part if they want a priest coming in the future. You can look over at the, at the book stall there, the book table. There's still some books, okay? We don't want to take those back to New York. Uh, I'll give a plug for one of them. Uh, I think probably a good percentage of us uh, know the story of Father Matthew Baker, uh, who was certainly the up-and-coming prospective new voice and theologian expert in the area of Father George Florovsky. Due to an auto accident, he was uh, taken before his time. Uh, we have, that's, a, what, Sarah, less than a week in our possession. But uh, have a look at that book. Uh, that'll be a real encouragement for all of you if you don't know that work and his writing. Okay, so I think we can stand. Let us pray to the Lord. Christ our God, extend thy right hand of blessing upon those who are participated in this conference this day, that all that we have undertaken may be an inspiration for each of us as we carry the glorious name of Jesus Christ into the world, and that we take that light which cannot be extinguished by darkness to those who seek fellowship with him and most importantly, those who will come to know him through the ministry of each of us. This we ask in the name of the triune God, whom we glorify, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen.